to, to express my happiness to follow uh, your presentation. I learned a lot, and I think uh, also for all our students and colleagues, this will be, will be very, 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 very useful. So as you say, maybe we, we have the time for a few questions uh, from the audience. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we will give your email to our students, and uh, I hope that also you can uh, collaborate and uh, in some uh, local research. You know that here in SPAX we have uh, this topic, and we have a uh, very successful researcher in the, in the field. So the first one comes from uh, Khalid Abelsi, maybe, so of course, you know uh, him. Hi, Matt. Uh, Hi. To know uh, what is the best uh, method uh, to measure uh, nap, the napping, the, uh, the duration of napping. I yeah, that's a that's a great question. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think uh, in the literature it's been done by multiple different ways. Um, I think the gold standard for for measuring napping is still via. Uh, polysomnography, um, that's the ideal world in a sleep lab, um, or maybe at home polysomnography, we have some devices where we can do that, a little bit less invasive. Um, some people use actigraphy, but um, it's not always great at picking up nap duration. Um, and then if we go to the other end of the scale again, uh, and we've done this before, is just self-perceived nap duration. Um, when it's really short, only 20 or 30 minutes, sometimes that's 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 just as good as using some objective measures. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Matt. So, uh, Matt, I, w I would have some, maybe uh, some, it's not a question, but uh, like, uh, I want to know uh, really in the field, like you as an expert in the field, do you really now uh, accept all this result? Because when uh, all, most of the studies use uh, subjective uh, methods, and really when we rely on only bedtime and uh, the time to wake up, do, do we really uh, evaluate or assess the sleep? Because you know sometimes you are on the bed, but uh, athletes maybe, or even in the general population, you will uh, lose a lot of time trying to, 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 to sleep. So, so, and most of the, the research published in the field are based on subjective uh, measure. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point, um, and, and you've highlighted there the limitations of subjective measures. Um, but I think, uh, on the whole, there's been quite a few studies now that have compared um, actigraphy to, to the subjective uh, measures, and most of the time, people are pretty good at, at estimating how much sleep they got. Um, as I mentioned in our study earlier, they over-predict their sleep, but it's not by that much, only about 20 minutes. Um, I think what people do is that they calculate the time spent in bed rather than the time spent in sleeping. So they think, oh, I went to bed at midnight and I got up at 8 a.m., so I got eight hours sleep. But they don't realise that they don't that they don't spend that whole time sleeping. So um, that's probably one of the biggest limitations of, of, of that. Um, but yeah, it's still it's still not too bad. We as humans are actually pretty good at estimating how much sleep we got. And uh, uh, second, the small question, uh, how much you think we need of measurement of sleep? You know, for example, in physiology, in uh, scientific follow-up, uh, sometimes we, we use more than one tools to assess one thing. Do you think that if you use the questionnaire or the dietary, diary uh, question, questionnaire are enough for uh, uh, sleep follow-up? How much tools we, we should use to have really an objective assessment of sleep? Yeah, okay, good question. Yeah, so I mean, I'm not a big fan of, of doing too much monitoring of sleep. I think um, a lot of the time athletes that are sleeping well, we should just leave them alone because sometimes you can do more harm than good. Sometimes if you have athletes that are already sleeping very well and you start monitoring them and start asking questionnaires, they can start thinking about a little bit more and they start sleeping um, sleeping less. So I think um, I'm a big fan of just using one or two really basic questionnaires and then based on that, so probably the two athlete questionnaires, based on the results from that, um, if there are no problems, then I won't talk any more about sleep or I won't monitor sleep of athletes. If it identifies there may be some problems, that's when maybe I will start to use actigraphy 
Um, and then if there are issues with actigraphy, that's when I might refer to a sleep specialist to do polysomnography. Okay. I will add another question, maybe the, the final question. So, uh, uh, have, we have uh, uh, like uh, threshold in the follow up when we have the scores of the athletes. Uh, can we detect, for example, uh, like the smallest worthwhile change, like in other uh, physiological parameters, to say really that there is uh, clinical significant change in the behavior of sleep? Can we do that with sleep? That's a, that's a fantastic question and that's something that I often think about um, and I don't think it's as easy as, as physical performance measures that we see in the sports sciences. It's very easy to determine smallest worthwhile change in, in, in some of those tests because we know the validity and the reliability of these tests but that's something that I don't think we have for sleep. I don't think we know uh, in healthy populations or athlete populations what the clinically significant changes actually are. Um, so that's a really, that's a difficult thing to establish, I think. It's a great point. Okay. There might be someone else in the audience that can answer that better than me. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough time, but we have a lot, a lot of questions. And again, thank you, thank you very much. So another uh, round of applause to Professor Matt. Thank you very much for accepting to participate in our Congress. All right. And uh, maybe this will be the lesson, this will be some advices to your organization how to establish or how to develop a journal. So I've been requested to, to share with our experiences. We do have uh, very good collaboration with uh, the Tunisian uh, researchers. So maybe we can even improve or increase this collaboration and, and, uh, and operate even, even better. So, first of all, special thanks uh, very much in depth to the editorial team for their dedication and uh, consistent work for, for the journal. I really acknowledge the reviewers for the great effort and consideration in improving the quality of uh, uh, manuscripts submitted to Biology of Sport. So, thank you very much uh, at the beginning. I have great pleasure to cooperate also with uh, uh, very good persons, very uh, well-skilled uh, uh, scientists. First of all, uh, special thanks uh, and uh, uh, greetings to Professor Karim Shamali, who has joined uh, our team, I think, eight or ten years ago and, and really have great input into developing our journal. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we are trying to cover uh, as many areas as possible. Uh, so, uh, together with us, there is also uh, Professor Gus Ahmetov, the expert in sport genetics, but also Blair Kuta, who is uh, currently affiliated to Institute of Sport in Warsaw, Poland. Special thanks for, for, to, to the Giovanni Padulo, uh, to Professor Agnieszka zembroni and and to Daniel Kontep. We have also great pleasure to have in editorial board Professor uh, um, Amar, uh, Ashraf Amar, Professor Tarak Dries, I think you are uh, you are familiar with uh, those great scientists. So we creating the journal together. This is our mutual cooperation. So Biology of Sport has been established uh, almost 40 years ago. So we do have almost 40 volumes published. It was a very difficult time in Poland to, to establish the journal. Of course, in the beginning, uh, it was published only in paper and it was available on, only in the library. So you can imagine how it was difficult to find this journal, to, to read the uh, research papers, to share the knowledge. Uh, so we have the origin, we have the beginning in the, uh, in the middle of communism in Poland. So it was very difficult time, but in 19... Uh, 92, it was not only Polish journal, but we have uh, we had a, a first international editors on board. So Professor Thomas Riley, Professor Anthony Hackney, and Ad Koviru has joined the journal. It, it was, I think, the beginning of uh, internationalization of, of this journal. In 2010, 
we did another significant step. so we digitalized the ah the first issues of the journal. so now you can find in google some issues from nineteen eighty s, nineteen ninety s and still people are using those papers and i know the history that professor marco cardinale has published his first ph d. paper in biology of sport and i think this is a great piece of of the history currently of course we are using the web page to to show the papers to increase the visibility in my opinion um the quality of the cut the content of the the journal i mean the quality of studies and the papers is most important but also the visibility is very very important for the readers and for the researchers to show the papers and 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 disseminate them into the practice so the main scope for for our journal is uh is uh are several areas so sports and exercise psychology sports genetics training and testing sports performance and analysis and some other biological aspects related to sport so the first question is is it mainstream trend or it was you know the 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 roots the 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 origin of of the scope and this created the the identity of the journal and identity of the readers and researchers so if you're considering uh what kind of what kind of scope or uh, are you willing to promote? Are you willing uh, to to develop? It's a good question. That you are going to to be in the mainstream, or you are looking for trend, or you are looking for very specific needs of the researcher or your university organization to show and promote current research projects. Uh, some insight into stats. Currently, we get uh, uh, around uh, six, seven hundred submissions per year. When we beginning, we have published only twenty-eight, maybe thirty papers, and there was uh, there were uh, I think forty, fifty submissions. So almost half of papers were published. Most of them were probably invited, but currently uh, there is huge interest in publishing research papers from different bunch of words, so we have around 600-700 submissions, but our policy of publishing uh, is that we're going to publish around 50 to 70 papers, so rejection rate or acceptance rate is only 10 or 11 percent. That's why we have decided to uh, to establish, to, come to, to introduce two stages of uh, um, review. First stage is pre-review. So after a submission, a paper enters the pre-review stage, and here the editors, but also the authors, should answer the questions: How does the paper fall within the broad remit of biology of sport? And is it probably formatted? Is it novel or and interesting? And I advise the the researchers to uh, to inform in cover letter or even inside the paper, what is novel and interesting for the uh, practitioners uh, in this paper and this research and, and show and give an opportunity to the editors to mark, to evaluate the paper uh, highly uh, in, in this area and this question. So another is, uh, is the subject area covered by the paper is topical and hence potentially interested to wide readership does the paper have a potential to make a substantial contribution to develop and broad sports uh, subject area? So th these are the first questions that we are going to answer and mark the paper and have the have a decision. It should go far into the uh, review process or should be rejected uh, or withdraw and to recommend any other journal that will be suitable for the authors. About submissions, uh, currently in 2021, we get submissions from 58 countries 
Uh, it's what's funny is it, it's Polish journal established in in Poland and uh, uh, the publisher is, uh, is is Polish one, but uh, submissions from Poland is less than three percent. I'm very happy that we do have uh, submission from Tunisia. Uh, it's around two percent of our submissions and. Uh, uh main directions are Spain, Brazil, Turkey, but also Portugal, France, Australia, United Kingdom, US. So uh, we we have the, the road from the only Polish uh, papers in the 90s to very international uh, environment in 2021. Within the last uh, seven years, uh, we got uh, uh, almost 3,000 submissions from 86 countries. And uh, again, the, the, the Polish papers are not uh, the most uh, common, uh, but still it's around 200. And again, I'm very pleased we get some submissions from uh, Tunisia. It's around uh, 2%, but uh, I, I'm, I know I'm aware that uh, uh, the acceptance rate of papers from Tunisia is uh, much uh, above the average. Uh, the, the journal is international also because of the reviewers. Uh, in 2021, uh, the reviewers came from uh, 38 uh, countries. That there was uh, 170 reviewers. In the previous year, there was more, more than 200, uh, but as, as I informed, we have decided to introduce a uh, two-stage review and uh, not so many papers go to second round. And uh, reviewers did a really good job and they did uh, for more than 400 reviews. This gives you some insight how, uh, how big, how many operations uh, we do in the journal and uh, how this is uh, uh what what is the load for this small editorial team most reviewers came from poland uh but uh, it's a uh, uh, it's a case that there is only few reviewers that do multiple reviews i do around uh, 100 reviews per year so that's why this uh, this uh, distribution is so skewed so it's a big uh, big percentage from poland but again, we, we do have a very international community and I think this is the strong point that we have reviewers from Spain, Brazil, but also a very high percentage from Tunisia and very good reviewers from Qatar also in the United States. Here you can see uh, how the impact factor score and uh, not the impact factor, but the citations and a number of published papers, how it uh, has changed in within the time period. So biology of sport is uh, indexed by Web of Science from 1995. And you can see that uh, it's not so obvious that uh, citation rate increase every year uh, in uh, the middle of uh, uh, the, uh, it is this millennium, we noted up and downs uh, in the citations and the number of uh, published papers increased in 2010 and we decided to keep uh, keep publishing policy to publish around 40 50 papers to improve the content to do some improvements in the publishing uh, process to be prepared for for the authors to be prepared with the electronic system and now in 2021, we have published uh, more than 70 papers. And in 2022, we will publish around 100 papers and we'll try to keep this rate uh, within the next years. But uh, as you can see, the uh, decisions were good enough to get uh, uh, increasing number of citations. And I think that within latest two, three years, we get more citations than within the whole history of of this uh, journal. Here you can see how the impact factor score uh, increased, but also you can you can see the contribution of citations. So in the uh, 90s and uh, 
in the beginning of this millennium. You can see small balls that represent total citations per year and how much it should have uh, increased to build impact factor. And I think we can expect impact factor for this year, for 2021, which will be little uh, above uh, 4.0. Uh, and currently there is 1,500 citations. It increased from around, I think, 50, 60 citations per year in the beginning. Uh, I've informed you that we have uh, many submissions from Spain and from uh, from uh, Brazil, Portugal, Tunisia also. But uh, here we can see the published papers, origin of uh, the origin of the published papers. Within the uh, latest uh, 20 years, it came obviously mostly from Poland, but uh, when we, we focus on only last four years, so the most significant for the impact factor score, we see that, uh, uh, again, it's very international, but uh, Poland is not, you know, uh, so it, it, it doesn't have so great uh, a percentage. Lots of papers from Spain, Brazil, Italy, Qatar, uh, US, but uh, again, uh, Tunisia and France are in top 10 uh, countries. The authors, uh, I've informed that we have a great leader in a team, so Professor Karim Shamari okay. has the greatest number of uh, papers, 20. And uh, yes, we do have also some uh, 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 top, pay, top, up, top, up, top authors from uh, Tunisia and from France. And, very happy that uh, that we that we do have them on board. On uh, board. When we think about uh, journal, we think about uh, scope. We think about uh, most uh, uh, popular topics. Currently, of course, it's COVID and the effects of COVID on performance, effect of COVID on sleep uh, quality. Uh, yes, and this is uh, we can see it in the most uh, cited papers within latest uh, three four years. Covid uh, uh, is the most uh, the most um, popular topic, but in biology of sport uh, we have decided uh, six seven years ago to increase number of papers about sports performance analysis and about uh, methodology so analysis of reliability and validation study and this is, this was a good decision it uh, helped us to increase impact factor and make the journal even more attractive for the for the uh, authors for the researchers and uh, when we when we see the uh, broader range of uh, years we see that all those all genetics and uh, papers related to the obesity high intensity interval training were uh, of interest of the readers and researchers and get lots of uh, citations um, I mentioned that uh, the visibility is one of the most important things uh, in the journal, and uh, that's why we have decided to uh, submit it to uh, PubMed. We did we did it uh, via PubMed Central. It is uh, additional based to PubMed. Uh, the wrong decision was that uh, we have decided to submit uh, each issue, so the authors uh, and the readers have to wait. Uh, to be that, that the issue should be released, so sometimes they are delayed. We have we are publishing uh, papers ahead of print, but uh, to be indexed in, in, in PubMed, we have to wait some time. Uh, a great motto that knowing is not enough, we must apply, so and willing is not enough, we must do. We are trying to improve our model of uh, dissemination of research. So to strengthen the channel, channel that uh, uh, can um, allow us to to be with the greater uh, uh, audience, there are some frames of this policy: so short, medium, and, and long one. We are mostly focused on short and medium uh, terms, and uh, one of the most important have been to, to use uh, social media uh, to disseminate the science. The most common are, of course, ResearchGate, 
but also we uh, have to plan to do some micro campaign in uh, Twitter and Facebook. We have considered which one could be the best. There are also some, some papers and some activities in LinkedIn, uh, like, uh, like the, the well-known researchers like Paul Bradley and Marco uh, Beato. They are willing to, to show the papers although in LinkedIn and make some discussion. This is a good idea. But some uh, research papers about disseminating the science uh, found that the Twitter seems to be the most powerful tools to, to show the papers. And uh, yeah, this is the lesson from medical journal that they use Twitter to optimize the visibility. And they found that uh, the, the most profound independent predictor of article citations will was whatever an article was tweeted and the odds ratio is uh, huge it's 14 so uh, it's uh, much uh, greater than for facebook posts so we decided to, to put our energy into twitter and uh, and we are going to to to, to continue this uh, policy also the other studies support uh, this thesis that uh, social media score uh, uh, could inform about um, potential of the papers of the topic maybe and uh, the social media score were more than five times more likely to be among the upper quantity of uh, most cited papers so it seems it's quite correlated another study from medical journal also confirmed that uh, highly tweeted articles were 11 times more likely to be highly cited and less tweeted articles. And uh, yeah, here is some, some, some graphs that shows the changes in citations for the papers uh, that was that were announced in Twitter and, and were tweeted. So as I'm informing you that we, we have uh, we have started this uh, policy uh, within the last four or five years, but currently we have put even more energy to, to, um, to show each paper, to show papers in uh, ahead of print uh, version. And sometimes I see that uh, authors even put the papers which was just accepted uh, here are some examples, but this is very short, uh, short commu communication, short uh, message about the journal, and we we do not uh, have very restricted copyright uh, policy, so we can show uh, the athletes, uh, uh, we can show the papers um, in uh, social media without any restriction, and we'll, we are very happy to to do this and. You can see here that some tweets uh, got very nice impressions, more than uh, 20, 20, 000. And here is the recent one of the recent one from December 4, from the Spanish Portugal team uh, uh, that uh, got more than 20,000 impression. Also, some uh, some uh, papers from team from Tunisia from Qatar. Here's an example of paper from Karim Shamari. Very nice, very short message about possibility, about the, the likelihood of the injury of the dominant leg. And this post got nice discussion and uh, more, around uh, seven, 17,000 impressions. Uh, here is a case of uh, papers from uh, Andrea Riboli. This is an example that we have invited him because he has uh, submitted very nice paper about uh, important topic for our soccer club. I'm also affiliated to Legia Warsaw Club, and he was invited for uh, Science for Football conference with great lecture. And he put in his lecture some novel results. The, pub the papers was not what was published ahead of print. Of, and was issued for 2021. The conference was in 2020. We made a micro campaign about his lecture, his person, his results, his papers. He got also some coverage with uh, infographics, which is great idea. And uh, additionally, he got some some tweets, some posts about his papers. Similarly with the other 
uh, athletes like uh, Jose Mario Olivia Lozano. And I'm very pleased that he got uh, so many citations even before uh, the papers has been issued to, to current issue. And I think this was one of the most uh, important uh, activities that gives us some uh, early citations and uh, allow us to improve uh, impact factor, which seems to be the most important for the authors. So this was the effect of uh, synergy. I also very like uh, the infographics. Uh, it gives you, you know, one minute uh, shot to to know the papers, to know the main conclusions, and uh, give uh, possibility to uh, review uh, so many papers in uh, in uh, short time and use it for your study. I'm very much also uh, thankful for Professor Treblesi, who also do some podcasts about his results, results of his study published in Biology of Sport, and this is another great and uh, great example how we can disseminate sports science with a broad audience. So I think that uh, nowadays the collaboration between authors and the editorial office is even more important. And I would like to declare that if you are willing to put uh, some information, graphical information, podcast about your papers published in Bible of Sport, we are, we are willing to promote together this paper and, and help to uh, to uh, to be close to to the broad audience as much as possible. There are also some treats, of course, like fake news. Academic publishing is not free of scandals where the spread of fake news is concerned, so we have to be careful. It's uh, also treats about you know personal things. Of, I mean, the reputation damage or uh, some. Mm, uh, uh, some problems in the organization to, to, to show the papers so or to be against the copyright. Uh, also, it's some it's time consuming, so we have to we have to be careful. We have to be aware. Uh, maybe it's not the time of this lecture, but we can also uh, we can also uh, discuss the model of journal development. There are a few model, I mean Leviathan for example, community and prestige. I prefer the community model if it's, if it's possible. I think that the community is the strongest uh, strongest point in, in, in our uh, editorial team. And if I can give some advices for the new journal of the journal that, which is uh, we're willing to, uh, to develop to change policy, I would like to uh, give you those uh, those uh, points. <clears throat> Sorry. All right. I, I think that uh, the time is uh, is uh, uh, is uh, close to the end. So yes. just the yes. Rest. Yeah. Okay. I, I will leave the time for any questions. If if you would like to to have it, I'm I'm very pleased to answer it and and help you. Uh, uh, in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Martin. Very interesting. Thank you for uh, sharing with us the, the history of the biology of sport, which is uh, one of the now of the very interesting target uh, journal to submit. And uh, we are glad also to see Tunisia in the top. Uh, uh, 10 seated uh, authors, uh, seated papers, and uh, top scientists, and uh, top 10 uh, categories. So, of course, uh, on the other side of the paper, there is a great team who works on the journals like uh, the IG SPP. So, I think this is uh, replicated. So, I hope uh, that uh, in Tunisia we can use this advice and maybe to, to, to develop a journal in sports science. Just two things, uh, Professor, so maybe, uh, as you said, uh, if we can get the online publication on PubMed on time, this will increase the, the citation number. Also, it will be very interesting for the candidates. Also, if because now we have more sports science students on the field, and maybe to think about increase the volume uh, number uh, 
and in the future this will be very 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 a test and thank you for your support to all Tunisian uh, papers so I know that uh, sometimes uh, we put some uh, <laughs> pressure to, uh, to to have the final uh, uh, draft or the final copy of the paper for uh, uh, for the authors thank you very much so I think that uh, we can move uh, directly to the next uh, presentation. So, uh, my professor uh, Piotr, uh, who will talk about uh, also the hot topic sports genetics. So, uh, the stage is yours. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you again. So, sorry for any delays in uh, this rather process, but. Again, I'm, I'm very pleased to uh, collaborate with uh, the Tunisian researchers and uh, yeah, this is good advice to increase uh, the uh, volume of each issue. We will do it step by step to keep the impact factor attractive as, as we said to be, to be uh, uh, as higher as possible. As, as far as I know, it's also important in, in Tunisia. All right, I'm going to, to share with my screen with the presentation. Could you please confirm that you can yes, see it? Yes, it's okay. Great. So th thank you again for the possibility to, to show uh, another presentation. Uh, I've been asked to, I've been requested to show some recent uh, findings about uh, genetic testing and sport performance. I'll try to focus on genetic characteristic of uh, competitive swimmers. Uh, in, in biology of sport, uh, uh, there will be a, a, a very nice review paper about uh, genetics, about candidates' uh, markers uh, for uh, genetic testings. And uh, there are ACE, BDCAR2, NOS3, and, and, and the others. So they are divided to the endurance related alleles that may be advantageous for long distance swimming and uh, for uh, short distance swimming, but also candidates for unisolated uh, phenotypes. Uh, several years ago, we did a study on uh, uh, polymorphism of uh, BD color B2 genotype. Uh, it's uh, brother king. This this research to evaluate station It has a microphone on and something happened. Focused was aimed to evaluate the association between uh, swimming performance and uh, uh, the polymorphics of bradykinin receptor 2 gen in successful competitive swimmers. Uh, the samples were genotype using uh, the PCR reaction. It, currently, it's uh, even more available. Uh, and we did the analysis, of course, about the frequency of the genotype in uh, swimmer population, in competitive swimmer population uh, uh, compared to controls. But also we did a, a comparison of the uh, results which are given by FINA points. Uh, for each athlete in short, middle and long distance, so we try to validate, we try to do some case control study 
to analyze if this uh, polymorphism will be meaningful, will be significant for the uh, talent identification. And unfortunately, uh, the, the, yeah, the power analysis was good enough uh, so because we use FINA points. It, it, was, it has great uh, you know, uh, uh, scale graduation. But we did not find statistical differences in this genotype, and uh, this uh, 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 genotype had no significant effect on swimming performance. Uh, it has been it has been uh, found in different population that could be meaningful, uh, but we were not able to confirm this. But we did. Uh, another study and uh, aimed to investigate the possible association between this genotype and training induced improvements. Uh, we have uh, selected 100 uh, best Polish swimmers, young swimmers, and uh, analyzed their results in short, middle, and long distance. And uh, we did not find again any differences in frequency but when we compare uh, in training improvements within uh, latest two years of course they have uh, improved their performance but we also analyzed if uh, this improvement was related to to this gen and in male population we found an interaction effect between this uh, gen this polymorphism with the scale of improvement and uh, swimmers with uh, plus nine plus nine genotype had a greater improvement in swimming performance than the uh, the others but no interaction effect for gender and this genotype has been found there is also another interesting study from uh, about the genetic profile in uh, gen associated with cardiorespiratory fitness in spanish uh, athletes and there is a, a very interesting idea to combine analysis of different single genotypes into one analysis using total genotype score. Uh, so it's calculated like, like this, that if some previous study uh, uh, provides some, some findings that this genotype could be uh, favorable for the performance, it gets some scores and some of the scores should differentiate the athletes with potential in cardiorespiratory fitness and as you can see here ACE very well known uh, genotype uh, so and it co it code codes enzyme of angiotensin 1 converting enzyme and uh, NO3 uh, ADR uh, A2A and the, uh, some others have been significantly different in uh, uh, athletic population, but when we uh, when we uh, genotype uh, when we use score of genotype, we can see some differences, but taken together, uh, they, it was not able to differentiate the uh, elite endurance athlete and non-athlete. So we are at the stage that we can identify some single polymorphism that could differentiate with very small variation. Sometimes it's uh, significant, sometimes insignificant. We are trying to combine this uh, gens together, find some, find some interactions and try to analyze if we would be able to use it as a, as a marker for the performance. And here the distribution of total genotyping score was not different in elite endurance athletes. In fact, the only one gen with a positive association with endurance performance was the N, uh, NOS3, because more than half of sample of elite athletes had the optimal genotype, but uh, in the end, there was no uh, that total genotyping score cutoff point to discriminate being elite endurance athletes. Uh, 
in one of my uh, latest uh, uh, study, we have analyzed the enzyme uh, polypeptide, which uh, uh, abbreviated name is uh, GAL and TL6. Uh, it play roles uh, uh, in a good microbiome regarding regulation of short chain fatty acids and their anti-inflammatory uh, role uh, has been considered. And the aim of the study was to compare genotype distributions and the LS frequency of this uh, polymorphism between elite short and long distance swimmer, as well as uh, to uh, sedentary controls. We have been provided uh, almost 150 poly short and long distance swimmers, almost 200, and we found that uh, CC genotype could differentiate between uh, could be different between controls and short distance swimmers. So there is a significant uh, uh, significance difference between controls. This study provides evidence uh, for an association between uh, this genotype and the short distance swimmers. We observed that higher frequency of TLL in the uh, short distance swimming group implied that sprint strength athletes may benefit from carrying this LL and uh, the TLL had a 1.5 times higher chance to achieve better results in short distance events. Although more, more, more studies are, are um, needed to confirm this in, and also in different populations. Another uh, possible, uh, another candidate for genetic marker was FTO uh, polymorphism uh, has been strongly associated with body mass related traits in non athletic populations, but rarely with the elite athletic performance. And we have aimed to investigate the frequency distribution of the FTA polymorphism between short and long distance elite swimmers. Uh, we have invited all, almost 200 uh, Polish swimmers. swimmers. And we found that, uh, in general, under the codominant model, the chance of being a swimmer was lower in the carriers of AT and AA genotype when we compare it with the TT uh, homozygote, uh, 1.5 to 2 times more uh, possible. But uh, when uh, short distance swimmer was compared against long-distance swimmers, no significant differences were observed in genotypic and allele distributions regard of the model of inheritance. Uh, another candidate was uh, the GSTP-110 that encodes glutathione uh, as transferase, uh, the protein one, and uh, we have aimed to verify the association between the frequency of uh, GSTP1 variants of exercise endurance performance and athletic status in uh, uh, two cohorts. We have invited uh, Russian athletes and, and Polish athletes in a replication study. And uh, we have found some differences in uh, power athletes and uh, uh, general Russian athletic population. So this is the first. Uh, this is the first uh, um, findings that inform us that there is some significant role of this uh, uh, genotype distribution and GLL frequency. And we found that uh, GSD1 is associated with elite athletic status. We observed a significant higher frequency of GL in combined group of Russian and Polish, Polish athletes. And results support the hypothesis that uh, GL may be partially responsible for endurance exercise performance. So, in uh, another study, we have aimed to explore the association between this uh, genotype, GSTP1, and the response to the 12 week program of aerobic exercise training. Uh, this was not athletic group, uh, the amateurs that undergone a 12 week aerobic program uh, 
based on dance activities. Each session has around 45 minutes, the intensity around 50-75% of uh, maximal heart rate. As you can see, not all participants respond positively. Results has uh, significantly changed, but improved. But you can see that some part of population did not change or even noted the uh, decreased results. But uh, we did an interaction time genotype uh, effect analysis and found that uh, the uh, individuals with uh, uh, GG plus AG uh, genotypes uh, improved their uh, maximal oxygen consumption more than the AA group. So a moderate size interaction gen and time effect was noted for at least three parameters, VO2 max, VE max and R max in the group of uh, uh, this specific uh, genotype. So the GSTP1 G allele was associated with gains in VO2 max and could be uh, another candidate for genetic markers. Uh, as uh, you can see, the results are not so obvious. Sometimes we find some positive uh, relations, positive associations, sometimes not. We are not able always to confirm. This means that uh, the variation that is explained is uh, quite low. That, that means that uh, we cannot use it as a valid uh, tool to differentiate the uh, potential of athletes or to use it for talent identification. Mm. Another group of interesting uh, genotypes, interesting uh, markers, are those one which could be related to uh, risk of uh, injury. There are at least few studies that uh, suggest that uh, genes coding uh, collagen could be associated with increased risk of uh, anterior cruciate ligament ruptures. And uh, we did a study uh, about uh, collagens, but also about interleukins. Here, uh, cytokines as uh, interleukins are crucial in regulating uh, critical cell signaling pathways, as well as being major contributors to inflammatory response. And uh, the genes encoding key interleukins, such as uh, interleukin 1b and uh, interleukin 6, uh, were selected as candidate genes for association with soft tissue injuries and we have aimed to verify the hypothesis that sequence variants uh, listed here uh, could be uh, could be um, related with ACL injury in Polish population and we found in the condominant model some significant differences between control group and group of patients with uh, ACL injury, but only in one genotype, uh, interleukin 6 gen, not in interleukin 1b and one uh, and, and other areas in, in this. So, uh, in another study, excuse me, in another study we uh, uh, have selected those genes and currently analyzing in broader population, also in the soccer players. Soccer players and skiers, uh, we have also selected uh, polymorphism of collagen type 12 uh, gen and analyzed it if it is uh, associate, associated with the ACL uh, raptures. And uh, we have analyzed uh, 91 male football players and unfortunately did not find any uh, relations. Uh, there are many other uh, single polymorphisms that could influence the, uh, th that could affect on possibility of risk factors or still uh, analyze them. What is good, we're trying to collaborate with the uh, other researchers like from South African populations and uh, there are 
another candidate uh, genes like collagen 3A1 and collagen 6A1. In this joint population, uh, we have found some uh, uh, significant differences in distribution of uh, genotype collagen call 3A1 and call 6A1. And here you can see the interfered uh, uh, haplotype frequencies distribution in those two populations. And in female participants, it seems that uh, T and A alleles within those two genotypes could be selected as candidates and need additional study to verify this hypothesis and to verify if you can use it truly for, for the uh, uh, injury risk prediction. Yeah, it, it, there's also an uh, interesting systematic review. Is there a genetic uh, predisposition to ACL uh, tier? The authors have selected the candidate genes that uh, uh, were significant in selected studies. So the next step is to establish collaboration with the other athletes with different populations to get greater sample size and do more powerful analysis and try to try to answer if there is any possibility to uh, predict some injury. I mean the biological predisposition. And if so, if we are able to to um, introduce a proposition of program for injury prevention, which is, uh, in my opinion, ethically correct, uh, and it's even more important than uh, uh, than selecting some markers for talent identification. So thank you very much for for your attention. And again, I'm very pleased to collaborate in this area also. Thank you, uh, Piotr, thank you very much, very interesting topic, especially with uh, high-level athletes. So you have the chance maybe to, to work with, uh, with athletes. So if I understand well, you are a former uh, swimming uh, player, athlete. Yes, yes, I, I've, I've trained swimming, also modern pentathlon, and currently pleased to, to work with uh, soccer players. Okay. So, so we have on the chat a message sent by Karim to recognize uh, your uh, efforts uh, for uh, the success in biology of sports. So we can read it uh, directly on the, the chat uh, side. So uh, I, I w genetics is very, very important, but unfortunately, of course, uh, this need cost, need a lot of money. And for some country, uh, uh, we can't really do that kind of, of this I have uh, some maybe small question first. Uh, at what age we should uh, do testing for athletes? Should we do that at early age or there is after effect, training effect? It can change uh, the predisposition of uh, genotype. Yeah, the, the genotype that, that does not uh, change within the uh, life, so the question is uh, open. In my opinion, still we do not know uh, so much to use genetic tests for talent identification. It's uh, very interesting for the scientists, for looking for candidates and to do replication study to understand more. So, uh, in my opinion, we should invite the adult uh, athletes, which were aware of the mean, which were aware of the meaning of, of the results, and always there should be someone who can advise them with the results, uh, and and be you know the reasonable with with uh, understanding and introduction, the the conclusions, the results. Uh, okay, uh, another question, uh, Piotr, about the methodology used. Always this kind of research use a correlate, correl correlation approach. And we know that this is uh, very limited in kind uh, to, to, to make an evidence-based relationship between uh, two variables. So is there any other possibility to study the relationship between uh, genetics and, uh, and sports? 
Yeah, very good questions. Uh, uh, that there are different tools, uh, more expensive and less expensive. Uh, always when you are trying to do association study with the frequencies, you need huge population to get uh, adequate statistical power. So sometimes it's better to uh, analyze uh, uh, the phenotypes and genotype. And currently there are also possibility to use uh, 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 different micrometers uh, uh, to analyze whole genotypes. And yeah, but it's even more expensive. So I think that the golden model for now is to do replication study using uh, phenotypes features, phenotype parameters related to genotypes in well-selected, well-established populations. Because especially now we have more homogeneous athletes, so because now maybe with the, the selection process, with the data identification process, I think we have a very uh, close profile of athletes. So now maybe we can replicate this study to really uh, see what uh, what are the uh, genotypes that are the most important for uh, different uh, sports. So the case is swimming, but I think maybe it would be different for other uh, for other sports. That's right. Yeah. F final question uh, 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 for the somatotype. So I know because I I, I participated uh, one study, but it was some uh, speculative things. But there was an association between somatotype and uh, some uh, genotype. So have you? Uh, get the chance to, to, to explore that field? Unfortunately, I'm not an expert uh, in this field. Uh, the FDO genotype, it was mentioned, it could be related with uh, somatotype uh, as it's related to fat mass, fat tissue. But uh, I, I usually yeah. aim to analyze the athletic performance or athletic status, not, not, uh, not somatotype. Okay, thank you very much again. So another round for applause to uh, participation in our Congress. Have a nice thank day. Have a nice day. Thank you very much. I do, I do hear you actually. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, please let me to, uh, to present our next speakers. Uh, I would like to thank, to thank you for your uh, presence in our uh, international uh, Congress. Uh, the next uh, session, uh, the next uh, presentation uh, from uh, Dr. Mohammed from Kuwait. Uh, he's an associate uh, professor in the Department of Physical <coughs> Education and Sports at the College of uh, Basic Education Institute of Authority. His main, uh, uh, his main uh, uh, research interest uh, in uh, physical activity related to uh, to treat uh, uh, age-related chronic disease and cardiovascular disease, cancer, hypertension, and furthermore, he is interested in the beneficial effects of habitual exercise on public health. So, uh, if you can, 
share your screen and uh, you can start, uh, start. Could you, could you see my screen? Yes, it's okay. Great, so thank you so much for the invitation to be part of this exceptional uh, conference. I am really honored and grateful to be part of it. And I would like to thank the, all the organization committee to organize this uh, kind of uh, conferences to be with this exceptional speakers as well. So uh, I would like today to share with you one of my uh, studies that I have done uh, a couple of years ago. So it will be talking about the efficacy of the swimming and cycling training in individuals with osteoarthritis. So through this uh, presentation of 40 minutes, I am going to talk briefly about osteoarthritis. Then we're going to see the link between the osteoarthritis and cardiovascular diseases. After that, we'll talk about the role of exercise uh, in managing people with osteoarthritis. Finally, we'll talk about specific mode of exercise, which is swimming. And finally, we will have a few messages and conclusions. So, arthritis is considered to be the, the first disease caused disability in the world, comparing with other uh, diseases such as back pain, heart trouble, lung diseases. Arthritis is considered to be the first disease to cause disability. So through this page, you could see osteoarthritis is the incidence of having osteoarthritis is by aging. When we get older, the greater chance we will have osteoarthritis. As well as you could see from this slide in the red line, it's the women, they are at higher risk of having osteoarthritis comparing with men. So briefly, what, what is osteoarthritis? Osteoarthritis is, is in, 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 to make it simply, is the breakdown of the cartilages. The cartilages is the substance that it's, it's there at the end of the bone and to prevent the, the fraction between the bones and to give the full range of motion. And in order to find out or diagnose osteoarthritis is by x-ray. And now you could also uh, diagnose osteoarthritis by the MRI. So, you could see here in the right side the, uh, of this slide uh, the x-ray and you can see the right knee and you could see that there's no space between the, the joint which meaning that there is osteoarthritis and this is considered to be a severe stage which is bone on bone osteoarthritis however in the left uh, knee, you can see the space here, which is the cartilages. Now, what are the signs and symptoms of osteoarthritis? So, the, the first symptoms is pain. People with osteoarthritis having a chronic pain, is specifically when they try to move. If they try to do any physical activity, specifically for the affected joint, they have pain. The other sign and symptoms could be joint stiffness and swelling, decreased range of motion, redness of the skin around the joint. So osteoarthritis can affect any joint in our body. It could affect the spine, hip, hands, foot, knee, and other joint in the body. However, there is a study in 2000, in 2000 actually, looked at the most affected joint with osteoarthritis and they find out it's the knee, the knee a joint, which is the most affected joint. Now, in men and women, then you can see the hip is considered to be the second affected joint, then actually other joint. But I think now nowadays, uh, if this, if, if we 
going to do the same study again, uh, specifically with the smartphone, with all the tablets that we are using. Specifically right now, we can have probably the knee, uh, neck osteoarthritis, and I am thinking that uh, knee uh, or neck osteoarthritis could be one of the affected joints these days. So, uh, what are the risk factors or what, what causing the osteoarthritis? So, unfortunately, until this date, we are not sure what is the main cause of osteoarthritis. However, there are risk factors. So, one of the risk factors that I mentioned earlier is aging, that we will get older and have a higher chance of getting osteoarthritis. So sex, like I said in the beginning, female at a higher risk comparing with male. Uh, genetics, so if osteoarthritis uh, runs in your family, you're most likely going to have it at some point, like other chronic diseases. Obesity considered one of the most common risk factors as well. I'm going to talk about it in a few slides here. As well as a sport, the sport considered to be also a risk factor for osteoarthritis. So, talking about obesity, obesity is considered to having a lot of uh, 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 chronic diseases such as Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular diseases, type 2 diabetes. And osteoarthritis, especially the knee osteoarthritis. So there is a study that looked at the people who are who have a normal BMI. They have 17 percent of uh, having osteoarthritis. Now, with these people becoming overweight, the chances going to be actually higher. Could, could, could consider to be around 12 percent. People who are obese, which is BMI more than 80, actually considered to have higher chance of getting osteoarthritis, which is around 80 percent. So why obese people having more osteoarthritis? There is, or there are two theories. The, the first one is because we are putting a lot of weight in our joint when we walk, when we start to run or do any kind of physical activity, the excessive weight that we are putting in, in, in our knee, that could lead to osteoarthritis. So there is a, the second theory is actually because obese people having a higher uh, inflammation and inflammation could trigger the osteoarthritis. So how sport could contribute to osteoarthritis? So the first theory is when you do a, a, a kind of a sport, have a repetition over and over and over in our joint loading, this could lead to osteoarthritis, such as uh, 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 runners, the marathon runners, marathon runners tend to have a higher osteoarthritis because they are running in a consistent uh, amount of time, which could make a load on our uh, our their joints, and this could actually lead to osteoarthritis. And unfortunately, this will end up stopping uh, participating in any kind of sport. The second theory is by injury. When when uh, when uh, athletes get injured, this could lead to osteoarthritis. In both ways, actually, or both scenarios could stop the participation in the sport. That this is not good. And as a coaches, we have to avoid this kind of trauma. Talking about osteoarthritis and cardiovascular disease, there is a study look at people with osteoarthritis, and these people have a higher rate of cardiovascular diseases comparing with the healthy, normal individuals. 
Now, talking about cardiovascular diseases, there are a lot of types of cardiovascular diseases. Uh, uh, stroke, coronary heart diseases, other cardiovascular diseases, but we could see around 80% of cardiovascular diseases is caused by the disease of the artery. This is actually causing the cardiovascular disease. So I will give you one of the most common uh, uh, disease in the artery, which is the stiffness. And I'm going to show you here just in a few minutes how a stiffness could actually, uh, how it works. So if I have a healthy individual and uh, an older person or person who is actually not doing a physical activity or a sedentary person, uh, these people definitely have uh, 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 arteries, but we're going to see in the left side, the healthy uh, artery, and the, and the right is a stiff artery. So when, the, when our heart pump floods through our artery, you can see how much our artery expands. And this is to compensate the, the amount of blood going through our artery. However, if we have a stiff artery, the, the artery could not really expand too much, and this is the why we're going to have a higher uh, uh, blood pressure on this artery. And by normal and uh, basic physics, that when you have a stiff uh, artery, the blood is going to move faster because it's stiff. On the other hand, if I have a healthy artery, the, the blood is going to move slower because I have the elasticity uh, component here. So this is what I found here in 2007 with a study that Saad did. Uh, and they found out that people with osteoarthritis, they have a, a higher arterial stiffness compared with the control group, with people who do not have osteoarthritis. And this is actually how you measure it is you have to measure how fast the blood is traveling from point to point in our artery. And the faster the blood is, 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 is moving, that means is our artery is stiff and vice versa. So arthritis is a pandemic actually, and there are and millions of people affected with this disease and unfortunately this disease uh, causing pain and these people actually suffering from this pain and, and having a mental problem because of this uh, disease. So the question is, okay, how could we manage osteoarthritis? So unfortunately, we do not have any cure yet for osteoarthritis. Scientists are working on it, but until this point, we do not have any uh, gold standard to, to treat osteoarthritis. However, the medication is one of the treatment that doctors prescribe for people with osteoarthritis just to really slow down of the progression of the diseases. And one of the Diseases is over-the-counter medication, which is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and prescription medication, which is kind of most similar as a painkiller. So the second thing now, the the, the medical uh, field uh, have the cortisol injection, which is really easy that you could have it at the same time. That is. Uh, you, do not, you don't have to have any anesthesia, it's easy, probably most doctors could do it right now. And it, unfortunately, it works for, for, for some people and it doesn't for other people. So in advanced stages, like in bone and bone osteoarthritis, you have to do a joint replacement. And actually, I, was, uh, I saw a few surgeries that took actually 
at least five to six hours. It's really invasive uh, surgery. And it, uh, it needs a lot of rehab after the, the, uh, the, the, the surgery itself. So the thing, the, the last thing that I notice is physical activity. Physical, physical activity is one of the uh, uh, things that you can do to slow down or control the stage of osteoarthritis that you have. So I look at this into more details. And one of the uh, well organization for arthritis, which is the American College of Rheumatology, they encourage people with with osteoarthritis to exercise. So, okay, what kind of exercises could I use? You could do walking, you could do water aerobics, you could do swimming, you could do cycling, you could do yoga, tai chi, and stretching. Okay, how often should I do it? For the frequency, you have to do it three to five times per week. Okay, for how long? It's, I have to do it for between 30 to 45 minutes per session. And this is their recommendation from the American College of Rheumatology for people with osteoarthritis. Matter of fact, with all this recommendation from this kind of organization, to encourage people with osteoarthritis to exercise, I find a very interesting study. So this study looked at people and measured their sedentary behavior. So they measure uh, normal people, and definitely all of us have a, a sedentary time that we do. Like we like 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 now, I'm I'm, I'm doing. A sedentary because I'm sitting sitting in my desk and lecture. This is what they do for my job. And they found out that around 15% of the normal individual they have a sedentary behavior. So obese people, they definitely they have a higher percentage of a sedentary behavior. This is why they are obese because they do not do a lot of physical activity. And this is why they gain more weight. Interestingly enough, people with osteoarthritis actually having more sedentary behavior comparing with obese people. And this is actually interesting to see why people with osteoarthritis having a higher sedentary behavior, meaning that they do not do exercise. And the problem is people who, are, who have osteoarthritis and obese at the same time, they are they having more and more sedentary behavior. And this is really a red flag because if you are doing, if you are, if you are not doing a physical activity, if you have more sedentary behavior, meaning that you will develop more and another chronic disease such as Alzheimer, cardiovascular diseases, and specific types of cancer, uh, and this is actually not good. So this is why I went to go through this problem: why people with osteoarthritis. They not, uh, or they do not do a, a, a physical activity or an exercise. So if you look at it, if you look at the, 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 the American College of Rheumatology precisely and go through the, the line by line, you have to check a few things here. And they have a message here, and you could you could see it for the person with arthritis, appropriate exercise is very important. So meaning that the type of exercise is important for people with osteoarthritis uh, comparing or more than the time of frequency. Here is the, the quote they have here. So there is another organization, probably most of you guys know it, which is the CDC. And also they have a recommendation for people with osteoarthritis. And you can see 
the type of activity is low impact aerobics. So here you could see there is a low impact. So now we have a new definition or new specific type of low impact aerobics. And one of the things Mohammed? Mohammed, are you listening? Yes. Do you hear me? Now, yes, yes, because uh, it's moving to the other hall. Okay, I'll okay. continue. All right, we will we'll proceed here. So, low impact aeroports such as swimming, cycling. Here is what it. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, it's okay now. Okay, all right. So this is what the recommendation for the CDC. And if we look at the recommendation for from the American College of Sport Medicine that we could see that, we could see the type low joint stress. So I highlighted here, low joint stress. Here is Again, it triggered me this kind of specific mode of exercise. Such as what? Such as swimming, cycling. These are, this, these are the types which are recommended for people with osteoarthritis. So there is another organization. We're going to go on and on. See, see how many organizations actually uh, recommend exercise for people with osteoarthritis. And here, the Arthritis Foundation, they have a huge campaign called the, uh, How I Fight My Arthritis Pain and My Weapon Against Arthritis is by exercising. And you, look to see, and you can see this guy is actually swimming. As well as there is a study look at the, the injury rate. And they found out that swimming or swimmers, they have the less injuries comparing with other uh, 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 mode of exercise. So when I try to look at the, the effect or a study, look at the effect of osteoarthritis and swimming, unfortunately, I did not find any study look at the benefit effect of swimming. And this is actually weird. Why all the, organi the health organizations encourage the, the, the people who are arthritis to swim and there is no group or there is no scientific evidence to support their claims. So this is why I came up with this study and the, the, I have the, the, per the, first, the first purpose is to determine the effect of swimming compared with cycling, exercise intervention, on pain, physical function, mobility, and strength in people with osteoarthritis. The second purpose is to determine the efficacy of swimming exercise and cycling exercise intervention on vascular and arterial stiffness in patients with osteoarthritis. So I collected uh, uh, 48 men and women uh, age between 40 to 90 years old, they, all, they were sedentary. They did not have any joint replacement in the past. They did not have any injection or steroid injection in the past six months, and they do not have any uh, cardio or pulmonary diseases. So what I have done is I take this 48 participant and I did the pre-test and randomly I assigned them into two groups, the swimming groups and the cycling groups. And it was a supervised, a 12 weeks exercise program, which is three months. And the, the frequency, they did three times per week. The intensity, they did 60 to 70 uh, percent of their heart rate reserve. And they did 40 to 45 minutes per session and when they finish, I definitely have done the post test. 
So the measurement that they have done is the questionnaire, which is a well-known questionnaire called the WOMAC. And this question is specifically for people with osteoarthritis and measuring the pain, physical function, and symptoms. And then the questionnaire that I use, which is the health-related quality of life, which is the SM86, which measures the physical health and mental health. For the objective measurement, I measure the uh, strength, uh, the isokinetic strength uh, by the index, as well as I measure the upper body strength by the grip strength. So for the mobility, I use the six minute walk test distance, and for body composition, I use the DEXA, as well as I use the waist and hips in conference. And I measure the arterial stiffness uh, by the carotid femoral pulse velocity. Uh, and uh, how, I, how I measure it, I put a, a sensor in the neck and a sensor in the femoral artery, and, and I measure how fast the blood could travel from the carotid to the femoral artery, and I could measure the stiffness as well as I measure the carotid artery compliance by the ultrasound. And I measure the resting blood pressure, resting heart rate, as well as I measure lipid profile, uh, triglyceride, LDL, HDL, and passing the blood glucose. So the result, so most of my participants were female. And I told you one of the risk factor is being female and having uh, also arthritis. Absolutely, uh, older people, uh, uh, the cycle group were uh, 68 years old, the swimming group were 90, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 59 uh, years old. So most of the affected joint were the knee, uh, 62% for the cycling group and 75% uh, for the swimming group. I have I had a really good compliance for the because it was a supervised uh, sessions uh, and I have 95% percent compliance for the cycling and 98% compliance in the swimming. So regarding the. Uh, the characteristic of the participant, I did not find any significant reduction in the uh, BMI. However, uh, both the groups were obese, that you could see uh, in the cycling uh, 31 and in the swimming 84, which consider obese people. And I told you in the beginning in this presentation, obesity considered to be uh, a risk factor for uh, osteoarthritis. And I did not find any significant difference uh, or reduction in uh, body mass. Uh, body mass, I find a, a significant reduction in two groups, as well as the waist and hip circumference. Uh, and the uh, visceral uh, adipose tissue the fat which is in, 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 in our body, especially in, 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 which is located in our organs. And I find out that people, after the intervention, they actually move or be more active comparing before the intervention. So for the WOMAC and the SF36 questionnaires in our body, I found a reduction in all my variables in pain, stiffness, function, mental score, physical score. I found a really significant improvement in all of these uh, uh, variables. And as well as I find a significant uh, uh, improvement in, in arm strength for left and right arm in both groups. So looking at the blood concentration, we actually 
did not find any significant uh, changes in, 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 in cholesterol, HDL, LDL, triglyceride, glucose, vesicle glucose. We did not find any change in these parameters. However, we only find out that there is a reduction in the systolic blood pressure, and there is no reduction in the diastolic and or mean uh, blood pressure. As well as the heart rate, we did not find any uh, significant uh, uh, change. So for the knee extension and uh, flexion, uh, and the angular velocity of 60 degrees per second, actually both the groups uh, increased their strength uh, in, in the lower body by the biotex uh, for the cycling group and the swimming group, comparing between uh, pre and post, for extension and uh, flexion. For the six minute walk test, I find a significant improvement in the distance uh, for both the groups. Mohammed, yes. We are close to the time, just uh, to. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm almost, I'm almost there. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I found out uh, a significant improvement. As well as arterial stiffness, I found a less. Uh, 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 their artery actually be become more uh, 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 elastic and less stiffness, as well as for carotid artery compliance. So then in conclusion for my talk, swimming exercise and cycling exercise, it's very uh, good mode uh, exercise for people, osteoarthritis, to improve their function, to reduce their pain, the stiffness, and to improve their cardiovascular function. And my suggestion here, it's for sport. I wish that coaches could try if people doing a lot of soccer or a lot of uh, marathon runners to really change the mode of exercise every year and then that to reduce the amount of injuries and continue participating in sport. So these two papers I have published in American Journal of Cardiology and the Journal of Pathology. If you would like to find more details, I really would like to thank uh, Dr. Hanley and as well as all the organization for this uh, uh, exceptional uh, uh, conference for organizing this uh, conference. Thank you so much, and I'm open for few minutes for questions, if we have some. And I'm really sorry for taking a few minutes. No, Actually. you are on time. Just uh, want to, to keep uh, some few minutes for some questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this very comprehensive presentation. Very clear, very didactic. And uh, it's not easy to work with uh, such population. Uh, so this is, uh, you are commended for this. Uh, so from the audience uh, here, so we will start by some few questions, uh, Mohamed. I will not uh, uh, really just uh, concentrate on your studies, but in general, do you think that now the recommendations uh, for the exercise are not enough uh, precise uh, in terms of those, just in general, uh, swimming, cycling, uh, there is no specific. Do you think that the dose of exercise or the intensity can uh, affect uh, the, the, the response uh, to the training and uh, improve the, the, the health of the, the subject with the heart rate? Oh, sorry, right. yes, yeah. correct. Yes, I, I, I don't agree with you. Actually, one of the studies that we could do in the future and see if the, the the dosage of exercise for, uh, and the health benefit of this kind of dosage of exercise for people that exercise, do, if we do more, are they going to get better? Uh, there is no study actually looked at that yet, and I, 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 I would like to do this kind of study in the future. But I'm assuming definitely the more exercise that we do, the better uh, uh, we will be. Because I did not see any meta-analysis uh, in your presentation, is there anyone uh, that uh, 
it's it's see this is an interesting point here. If you this is a huge topic for, for people with osteoarthritis. So there are the, the, there are a lot of conflict of of uh, uh, results in, in exercise of people with osteoarthritis because you could not give obese people a, a walking mode of exercise because sometimes when we have obese people, when they try to walk, they have more weight actually putting on their joint. This is why some or a few studies have a negative effect of, uh, of exercise on people with osteoarthritis. And, and this is why the, 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 there are a lot of studies actually in this field. I think because the mode of it. Yes, thank you, thank you again very much. Another uh, round of applause uh, for Ahmed. Thank you for uh, your participation in our Congress. So, uh, good luck with uh, the future. And uh, we will see, of course, uh, many uh, papers from your side. We'll be happy to read them. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Uh, Doctor, uh, Doctor Bashir, Bashir uh, is here. Doctor Bashir, do you hear me? Hello, bonjour. Bonjour. Bonjour, vous m'entendez? C'est parfait. Just a few minutes. C'est bon? Vous, vous arrivez à regarder le, le slide? Ready to start the next uh, presentation. Welcome to Dr. Bashir. Uh, just uh, one minute to present our uh, next uh, lecturer, uh, next uh, uh, presenter. Uh, Dr. Bashir, he is the lecturer uh, at the fac Faculty of Sports Science and uh, professional of uh, Valenciennes. Uh, he is, he is uh, uh, a specialist in performance psychology and more particularly in the decision making and expert players in sport high level collective. Thank you for your presence, uh, presence and uh, uh, you, you can start. Ok. En tous les cas, merci pour uh, cette invitation. Et je, je vais parler en français, mais j'ai mis les slides en anglais pour les, les gens qui ne comprennent pas le français. Euh, je, je remercie M. Hamid Chetourou euh, pour euh, euh, l'invitation. Je remercie aussi le, le comité d'organisation pour euh, ce, ce, cet agréable congrès. Euh, congrès. Et je salue euh, tous les, et la population et les étudiants et, le, et les collègues tunisiens qui sont sur place. Euh, 
Ça coupe un petit peu Non, il n'est pas partagé. Il n'est pas encore partagé, le votre écran. Ah, ok. Je vais le regarder. Parce que je n'ai pas l'habitude de travailler avec cette interface que vous avez. Ok. Ouvrir le partage. C'est bon Ça marche Oui, ça marche. Ça marche. Parfait. Donc, euh, comme je dis, je, je remercie les, tous les collègues et les étudiants euh, euh, de, de notre cher voisin et pays, la, la Tunisie. Et donc, moi, j'encadre je, pas mal de, de doctorants et même il y, a, il y a des collègues actuellement qui sont passés chez moi de la Tunisie. Donc, aujourd'hui, moi, je vais faire une conférence un petit peu ouverte parce que, je, comme je sais que. Il y a beaucoup d'étudiants de TESA qui sont en place et pour voir un petit peu comment nous on, on traite les, les questions euh, que je vais aborder aujourd'hui qui consistent à parler des nouvelles technologies et la condition, c'est-à-dire, et je vais faire une illustration un petit peu plus pratique sur le, le domaine du football. Donc globalement, qu'est-ce que je vais euh, euh, présenter Rapidement, mais, mais, mais pas beaucoup, euh, seulement pour donner une idée sur l'évolution du jeu au football. Et, et cette évolution, elle a des conséquences énormes sur le plan scientifique et technologique. Vous allez voir après. Le football, quand il a débuté dans les, euh, dans les années 1887-90, à peu près, euh, le football était réglementaire, il n'était pas organisé, il n'avait pas beaucoup de choses. Mais si on le compare avec le football actuellement, euh, actu actuel, il y a une organisation et cette organisation nécessite une compréhension. Donc déjà quand on commence à s'organiser, le cerveau a besoin de, euh, de, de, de décrypter l'environnement, de lui donner du sens. Et, et c'est ça, euh, euh, comment on dit, cette évolution d'une pratique, comment elle a influencé ensuite sur l'étude de la collision et je vais parler un petit peu de la collision euh, de l'entraîneur et comment cet entraîneur par exemple il va euh, utiliser euh, tout son système qu'est ce qu'on appelle le système collectif pour après pour comprendre pour présenter pour donner des consignes pour analyser et pour euh, aussi euh, mettre en place des processus d'apprentissage à, à ces joueurs Globalement, si je reste dans cet aspect historique, au départ le football c'était plus tirer et courir. Après, il y a, dès les années 1876, il y a la fameuse passe qui a révolutionné le football. Et à partir de 1927, on a commencé à faire la première organisation, qu'est-ce qu'on appelle le WPM. Et cette organisation, elle a donné déjà la première lutte à une organisation. C'est seulement pour vous dire que euh, la science ne vient pas comme ça et la technologie ne vient pas de, de ce type. Maintenant, si je prends le fonctionnement de, de, des entraîneurs, comment ils fonctionnent les entraîneurs les, les entraîneurs, quand ils regardent des matchs, ils vont prendre un certain nombre d'informations. Et c'est euh, informations exactement. Je, ils vont faire trois choses importantes. La première chose, c'est euh, qu'est-ce qu'on dit ici ils, ils souhaitent comprendre, mémoriser les, les situations complexes de jeu euh, durant les matchs. Euh, ils souhaitent aussi euh, mettre en place la deuxième partie euh, des exercices pour améliorer, pour modifier le comportement de leurs joueurs. Et pour cela, et pour cela, c'est ça qu'est-ce qui nous intéresse ici euh, Pour euh, transmettre ces connaissances, ils ont utilisé trois procédés. Qu'est-ce qu'on appelle ces trois procédés il utilise la consigne verbale, exactement. Il utilise euh, l'action. Donc, il, il y a des gens qui sont sur le terrain pour modifier les, les, les choses. Et il utilise enfin, les supports visuels. Il, 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 euh, il essaye d'utiliser les trois, les trois supports. Et tout ça pour permettre à, à les joueurs de comprendre le jeu, analyser le jeu et pas mal de choses. Donc, ici, moi, je... Je vais prendre seulement la partie visuelle et pour vous donner seulement la genèse de, de, de notre amour. Donc déjà ici, quand on commence à travailler sur la, 
qu'est-ce que j'ai dit si je prends seulement les consignes verbales et les supports visuels Déjà, la théorie, elle a commencé dans qu ce qu'on appelle le modèle de Maillère, sur, la, sur qu ce qu'on appelle la, 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 théorie, la théorie de multimédia euh, de l'apprentissage. Et lui, il dit, euh, regardez, le cerveau, il est là. Et ce cerveau, si on donne des consignes verbales, il passe par un canon bien spécifique dans le cerveau. Si on donne seulement des images de jeu, il passe par un système. Et si on croise les deux, il va passer par deux systèmes. Donc, une fois qu'on arrive à ce stade, il y a la question maintenant, on utilise des, des, qu'est-ce qu'on appelle euh, des moyens de communication et quels sont leurs effets sur l'apprentissage, surtout nous, qu'est-ce qui nous intéresse, l'apprentissage tactique en, 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 en football. Parce que souvent, les entraîneurs, euh, j'en vois aussi sur, sur les, les télévisions aussi, euh, pas mal de gens qui utilisent des outils d'analyse euh, de, de, de jeu et tout, il ne suffit pas d'avoir un outil, mais de savoir aussi comment présenter ces données au, sur, au, au cerveau. Et ici, je, je me contente seulement sur le processus de compréhension de jeu euh, par, euh, par exemple, quelqu'un qui apprend. Dans ce cas-là, dans le cas du, du football, c'est le joueur. Maintenant, petite définition pas, pas importante, parce que je vais rester seulement sur quand on utilise l'image. Quand on utilise l'image, il n'y a pas de langage avec. C'est seulement parce que, qu'est-ce qu qui nous intéresse ici Est-ce que l'image tout seul, si on présente à quelqu'un, euh, elle permet à un joueur ou à un entraîneur euh, ou à l'arbitre, n'importe qui, de comprendre le jeu exact, Exactement, il faut donner une définition. C'est quoi une présentation visuelle C'est toute la, une présentation qui vient, qui a une notion de euh, représentation visuospatiale et que la personne voit soit sur un écran, soit sur un téléphone, soit sur le terrain. Tout ça, c'est des représentations visuelles. Pour rester, je vais parler seulement de ce point parce que le domaine il est très très vaste. Il y a beaucoup de choses à faire, mais je vais rester pour montrer aux étudiants aussi qui nous regardent qu'on peut isoler un paramètre et ce paramètre-là, on peut l'étudier et voir son effet sur pas mal de choses. Et euh, je reviens sur l'évolution euh, un petit peu de ce support. Ce support, euh, comment ils ont évolué parce qu'on ne peut pas faire une étude en passant directement sur des choses euh, récentes il faut voir l'histoire et voir qu'est-ce qu'on qu qu faisait avant il n'est pas mieux que maintenant euh, par exemple les, les gens qui nous regardent quand on était jeunes euh, on faisait des, des schémas tactiques sur un terrain après il y avait des tables noires après sur les papiers après on a fait des, des choses Ça, tous ces supports, qu'est-ce qu'on appelle support visuel ils ont essayé de, de les intégrer dans le domaine du foot, c'est comme le scolaire, pour permettre à des joueurs de comprendre un petit peu qu'est-ce qu'on attend d'eux de, 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 sur le terrain. Ensuite, il y a ces supports qui se sont développés. Euh, dès 1961, on a commencé à mettre des visages sur les, les supports pour permettre aux joueurs de comprendre. Après, on a ramené des, euh, des tableaux avec des, des, pour bouger les, les, les joueurs, parce qu'avant, c'était statique avec elle a créé, après c'est l'informatique qui est rentrée et après maintenant on a, qu'est-ce que vous voyez, euh, les nouvelles technologies par exemple comme des logiciels comme Darfish et tout qui permet de travailler sur les, les images vidéo. Donc il y a une évolution technologique importante et derrière cette euh, technologie il y a une, euh, les industriels vendent que euh, c'est avec ça qu'on va avoir euh, permettre à nos joueurs d'apprendre de, de, plus vite, à assimiler les consignes de jeu et tout. Et ça, c'est un, un, ce qu'on appelle un, des, des informations marketing pour le vente. Nous, les chercheurs, qu'est-ce qui nous intéresse Est-ce que c'est vrai Est-ce que c'est ces représentations qu'on montre Est-ce qu'ils vont apporter quelque chose euh, sur le terrain Donc, il y a la vidéo aussi, après les trois Je vais pas rentrer. Nous, et euh, ça fait, moi j'ai travaillé beaucoup sur, euh, depuis 90 sur la prise de décision chez les entraîneurs, mais après, on a, après le mouvement, on a développé des, des choses qui sont intéressantes euh, dès les années euh, euh, 2002-2003 avec Hubert Paul. Et la question, qu parce qu'on a travaillé beaucoup sur les images, sur la vidéo, et la première chose qu'on qu a constaté, que, euh, euh, que, par exemple, soit un joueur expert, soit un joueur euh, novice, euh, euh, il y a une opération collective très 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 importante 
quand on présente des choses sur le tableau. Euh, ce n'est pas aussi facile que ça, ce n'est pas aussi simple que ça. Il y a tout un processus cognitif qui rentre en jeu, et ce processus cognitif, il est, il est complexe, et on a posé la question comment on essaye de l'étudier pour comprendre et ensuite après donner des, 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 des solutions, des solutions à, à, aux gens en, sur le terrain. Donc euh, le but ici aussi, euh, euh, ça c'est euh, euh, nous en tant que, que chercheurs pour comprendre les processus cognitifs, mais il y a un deuxième point qui est important, est-ce que qu'est-ce qu'on donne aussi sur le terrain, on peut le traduire sur le, sur le tableau, pardon, est-ce qu'on peut le traduire sur l'exemple de terrain Et c'est pour cela que j'encourage les, les, les étudiants qui sont en, en thèse de poser cette double question euh, théorique et pratique. Qu'est-ce que je fais Même si le fondamental reste un, un, quelque chose de très, très, très important, parce que c'est nécessaire de faire le fondamental, mais après il faut essayer de, euh, essayer de traduire cette, ces connaissances euh, au niveau fondamental à des connaissances un petit peu plus pratiques qui, qui est utilisées socialement. Et c'est ça qui fait que la plupart des, 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 des gens, ils arrivent à trouver des financements parce qu'on apporte une réponse réelle à la société. Ça, c'est un petit conseil que je donne aux gens qui travaillent sur la recherche dans le domaine du sport, quel que soit le domaine. Donc, j'ai représenté un petit peu rapidement cette évolution euh, technologique. Maintenant, euh, il n'y a pas uniquement euh, la question de l'évolution technologique, il y a aussi une évolution euh, des connaissances sur le, euh, les sciences. Euh, qu'est-ce qui nous intéresse aussi, euh, c'est la cognition, c'est-à-dire euh, qu'est-ce qui se passe dans le cerveau du, du, du sujet et comment euh, la recherche, les scientifiques, ils ont compris ce processus euh, de fonctionnement de, de notre système cognitif. Je ne vais pas rentrer dans beaucoup de détails parce que ce n'est pas le but. Euh, toujours, pour faire de la recherche, il faut s'appuyer sur un ensemble de, de théories. S'il existe, c'est toujours agréable. Et nous, euh, il y a une théorie qui nous a euh, marqué, c'est la théorie de la charge cognitive euh, de, développée par Sweller. Euh, lui, il pose trois questions. En général, il dit que le cerveau il a une capacité limitée, on ne peut pas... Euh, vu la, vu notre, euh, on ne peut pas traiter toutes les informations qu'il y a dans l'environnement, c'est très complexe, surtout, euh, surtout s'il y a beaucoup d'interactions. Euh, euh, sur, sur, la première, c'est le, le fonctionnement collectif, c'est-à-dire la mémoire, que, comment elle fonctionne, est-ce qu'il y a la mémoire de travail, je ne rentre pas aussi dans, dans ces détails. Après, le niveau d'expertise, est-ce que le, la personne est euh, expert en novice, son âge et une capacité visuelle spatiale tout en sachant que cette capacité visuelle spatiale elle était, elle est actuellement abordée avec un étudiant qui est chez moi, qui va soutenir sa thèse euh, très très bientôt, qui montre qu'elle joue un rôle très très important. Après, le deuxième point qui est important, c'est la complexité. Il dit que euh, non seulement le, le système, le, le cerveau, il a des capacités limitées, mais en même temps, il y a aussi un deuxième problème qui, qui, qui est énorme, c'est la complexité du contenu. Qu'est-ce qu'on donne au, au sujet Est-ce qu'il y a trop d'informations Est-ce qu'il y a peu d'informations Est-ce que ces est informations sont rapides Et ils disent s'il y a trop d'informations et, et on le donne rapidement, qu'est-ce qu'on appelle les interactions euh, Le cerveau, il a, il, il a des problèmes d'analyser des, des, des matchs. Vous, je vous donne un exemple. Quand vous regardez un match de foot sur le terrain, vous êtes incapable de faire une lecture globale. Vous faites par petits morceaux et après vous collez. Et c'est ici euh, une des, des limites de, de fonctionnement collectif de, de sujet. Après, il y a la troisième partie euh, qui est ici. Euh, la troisième partie, c'est surtout euh, le, rôle, le rôle de l'entraîneur. Comment présenter cette information qui peut être complexe Comment l'organiser pour permettre à quelqu'un de l'apprendre de, de comprendre, euh, par exemple, un système de jeu Et ça, c'est les, les choses qui nous intéressent au plus haut niveau. Nous, actuellement, dans nos travaux, c'est comment mettre en place des organisations de contenu qui permettent à un joueur de différents niveaux d'expertise de comprendre plus vite facilement. Ensuite, euh, je reviens aussi rapidement, mais pas pour beaucoup. Euh, ici, 
j'ai parlé tout à l'heure du système politique qui a une capacité limitée. Il a une capacité limitée parce que euh, on sait que qu'est-ce qu'on appelle la mémoire de travail, elle peut, pour quelqu'un qui débute, elle peut contenir sept plus ou moins deux informations. Non et ça, ça pose problème au cerveau parce que s'il y a plus que ça et si on n'a pas l'habitude de, de traiter ces informations et si on n'est pas expert dans le domaine, ça peut nous poser un, un, un problème pour la compréhension ou l'apprentissage ou la mémorisation. C'est pour cela qu'il euh, faut connaître ce système cognitif de façon débaillée pour décortiquer ou pour couper les informations. Après, il euh, y a un va-et-vient entre cette mémoire de travail qui est nécessaire pour l'apprentissage et la mémoire à long terme, ce qu'on appelle la mémoire à long terme, c'est la mémoire qui a plus de connaissances spécifiques dans le domaine et c'est plus elle est riche, euh, plus on est expert, on peut euh, dépasser les situations complexes, grosso modo, hein, sans rentrer dans, dans, dans le détail. Donc, euh, maintenant je vais essayer de vous présenter, une fois que j'ai présenté comment l'évolution du jeu a influencé sur... Euh, la recherche, la technologie, j'ai présenté aussi les développements technologiques et j'ai donné quelques cadres théoriques qui vont vous permettre de comprendre qu'il y a une interaction entre l'outil qu'on met en place et aussi du cerveau, ou l'inverse, des fois on traite les cerveaux et après on crée les, les outils. Donc les premières études que nous avons développées, et ça c'est très 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 important, ils ont commencé euh, dans les années 2000, euh, 2007 et je vais vous montrer si je peux euh, euh, rapidement. On a créé dès 2007 un, un logiciel, je ne sais pas si vous voyez. Non. Vous voyez l'image Non, on vous voit. Ouais. Donc ça c'est... Non, non, on ça, non, on voit. Hein Non, ce pas affiché. C'est pas affiché On vous voit. Voilà. Ouais, attendez. Ouais, 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 Parce que j'ai lancé un film. Bascule de nouveau vers le, la présentation. Oui. Ouais, maintenant, oui. Donc, euh... maintenant, oui. Maintenant, oui. Non, maintenant, on voit euh, aucune photo, juste caméra. Donc, il n'est pas activé. Et, 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 et si vous ne voyez rien Environ, on va faire. Euh, je, je voulais vous montrer le, euh, le premier le, le logiciel, peut-être ça. Euh, sinon, je veux. Je, 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 sinon, c'est pas. Si vous mettez le, le, le vidéo sur un support pour ça. Euh, elle ne voulait pas. Depuis tout à l'heure, je voulais l'activer sur le PowerPoint. Euh, c'est pas grave. On, on, on va rester comme ça. Ok. okay. Donc, euh, elle n'est pas dynamique, je vais rester. Donc, euh, nous, on a développé le premier logiciel euh, en 3D avec immersion. C'était dans les années de... Merci de revenir sur le PowerPoint. Donc, euh... Ah, je, je suis revenu sur le PowerPoint. Hein. Non C'est pas encore affiché. Attendez. Est... Il n'est pas affiché Euh, on les partage. Oui. Et maintenant Oui. Ouais, c'est bon. bon. Donc, euh, qu'est-ce que vous vous montrez ici Ça, c'est le premier. Euh, on était un, un des, des, des premiers à construire avec l'Université de Marseille, à, à construire, qu'est-ce qu'on appelle, un logiciel que vous voyez actuellement qui sont, qui sont devenus très. Euh, très utilisé dans le domaine du football, c'est qu'est-ce qu'on appelle euh, l'immersion, c'est-à-dire les euh, construire en, en 3D. Ce logiciel, l'avantage qu'il a, a, a qu'on a construit, on peut faire l'immersion, rentrer à l'intérieur, voir qu'est-ce qu'il voit le joueur. On, a, on peut voir aussi, euh, aussi les, les déplacements des joueurs en 3D de, de, de tous les angles et tout. Et ce logiciel-là qu'on a créé. Euh, on avait une idée commerciale derrière. Donc, euh, et derrière l'idée commerciale, on en avait aussi euh, une idée aussi pour le développement théorique, pour valider, parce que tous les logiciels développés par les informaticiens, c'était des logiciels euh, techniques, euh, mis en place avec des entraîneurs, mais pas euh, avec des chercheurs. Et nous, avec l'université de Marseille, avec l'université 
on avait cette possibilité avec des informaticiens. Et à partir de là, euh, vous connaissez tout le monde, euh, Monsieur Kacharam Ayman, qui était mon premier étudiant en test. Et lui, il a travaillé sur le logiciel et c'était l'avantage qu'on a euh, euh, par rapport à son logiciel pour, pour, pour comprendre est-ce que les joueurs sont capables d'utiliser de, de, ou de mémoriser ces, ces situations euh, artificielles et, et après pour euh, euh, comprendre un petit peu un système de jeu, mémoriser un système de jeu et ainsi de suite. Donc, à partir de là, on a écrit beaucoup de papiers. Donc, je vais, pour vous dire pourquoi je vous montre ça, euh, ça veut dire que la recherche, elle a deux choses. Elle a la nouvelle technologie, elle est nouvelle. Et après, vous avez un bagage ou un cadre théorique. Vous avez la possibilité d'avoir beaucoup de publications parce que vous, serez, vous êtes les précurseurs dans ce domaine. C'est pour cela que toujours les gens qui sont en avance sur des... Maintenant, on donne un exemple. Avec le problème de Corona, tout le monde écrit Corona. Toutes les papiers qui passent sur le Corona, ils sont parce que les gens ils essayent de trouver une solution. La technologie, c'était pareil. Quand on a commencé les, les technologies, toutes les papiers, tous les papiers qu'on mettait en place, c'était euh, des, 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 des études originales. Et ces études originales nous ont permis de publier beaucoup, beaucoup de papiers dans, dans, dans ce domaine. Donc, maintenant, je vais revenir sur le plan scientifique. Pour vous montrer aux étudiants, donc c'était intéressant, je pense, de mon côté, de sensibiliser les chercheurs jeunes sur ces questions, parce que des fois, on ne reste pas seulement sur le, le plan théorique, si on n'a pas une vision globale. Maintenant, je vais revenir à un travail d'expérimentation, de, de, travail de recherche, et la première étude, ça c'est la thèse de Heyman, est-ce que, euh, on a posé une question simple, est-ce que l'image, si on la présente statique ou dynamique, quelle est euh, la force de, de support en fonction, en fonction de l'expertise des gens euh, Quelqu'un qui, qui est débutant et quelqu'un qui est joueur de bon niveau. Est-ce que, de préférence, il faut leur montrer des images statiques ou des images dynamiques Et on a posé les deux questions par rapport à ça. On a dit, est-ce que, comme je l'ai dit, euh, les, les supports dynamiques et statiques, euh, quel est le meilleur support pour, pour mémoriser ou apprendre Et la deuxième question, est-ce qu'il y aura un effet d'expertise Est-ce que les deux ils vont préférer statique Est-ce que les deux ils vont préférer dynamique Ou non, il y a un qui préfère le statique, un préfère le dynamique. Donc voilà une petite euh, première étude qu'on a fait, réalisée. Donc euh, euh, ici, on a pris trois, euh, trois situations. La première situation, c'est dynamique. C'est un film qu'on demande aux joueurs, on fait une phase de jeu à 5 ou à 6 joueurs, qui font une montée de balle de A jusqu'à tirer au but. C'est le vidéo, c'est elle tourne. Et on demande aux joueurs de mémoriser ce plan de jeu. La deuxième chose, qu'est-ce qu'on a dit On a montré une image statique, mais par contre, c'est des images statiques, mais on montre à des gens d'une étape à l'autre, et ça, ça reste, il reste des traces. On va vous montrer le, ici, ça monte, ça monte, ça monte, et le, les gens regardent les traces, il peut revenir s'il veut, mais elle est statique. Et il y avait une troisième situation, c'était statique, mais à chaque fois, il passe d'une un, étape à l'autre, on dépasse l'étape qui est passée. Donc, qu'est-ce qu'on appelle euh, la, la situation dynamique la situation avec des traces et la situation sans traces. Donc on a pris des joueurs de football de certains niveaux, on a pris des, des débutants, on a des critères euh, de sélection, ça c'est normal, euh, c'est des classiques en recherche, il faut prendre des paramètres pour dire c'est qui expert, c'est qui est novice. Et la procédure elle est, elle est suivante, euh, le sujet il est face à un écran, un grand écran, il a des lunettes, il a des... Et on lui montre un petit peu comment les joueurs essayent de monter, soit en statique, soit en dynamique. Et on garde une situation à 32 secondes, soit en dynamique et en statique. Donc le but, c'est de regarder et mémoriser le plus rapidement possible. Donc, les, 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 qu'est-ce qu'on essaie de, dans la première, une fois le sujet, il regarde tout ça, qu'est-ce qu'on va essayer de prendre comme indicateur de l'apprentissage la, ou de l'efficience, euh, combien de fois il répète la situation pour mémoriser. Donc ça c'est la répétition. 
Après, on lui donne un test qui, est, qui a été réalisé par PAST pour lui dire est-ce que c'était pour lui difficile ou pas. Un, c'est pas beaucoup difficile, mais neuf, c'est des, euh, plus euh, difficile. Et la troisième chose, il doit nous transcrire sur le terrain la montée, de, la, de, la montée des joueurs de A à Z. Et ici, on regarde combien de choses qu'il a mémorisé euh, le joueur. Donc ici, euh, la deuxième situation, c'était statique. Et vous voyez euh, que toutes les informations avec état, c'est pareil, on fait la même chose. Et qu'est-ce que j'ai montré tout à l'heure, état par état, on fait la même chose. Donc, les résultats, c'est ça qui, qui est important euh, en dehors de, des conditions expérimentales. Les résultats, ça c'est l'efficience, c'est un calcul qu'on met, c'est exactement l'efficience, c'est égal nombre de rappels, euh, moins l'effort mental sur racine de 2. C'est une formule classique euh, qu'on utilise souvent, euh, nous, dans nos papiers. Donc, qu'est-ce qu'on regarde ici par rapport aux résultats Ça, c'est la situation dynamique. Ça, euh, la situation où on laisse les traces. Ça, c'est les situations où on ne laisse pas les traces. Qu'est-ce que vous voyez ici en, en rang C'est les experts. Et qu'est-ce que vous voyez ici C'est les novices. Et ici, euh, l'efficience, plus c'est bien, c'est plus vers le plus, de zéro vers le, le positif. Et moins, c'est pas bon, c'est de zéro vers le négatif. Qu'est-ce qu'on observe réellement sur le même contenu qu'on donne en dynamique on voit que les, les joueurs novices, les joueurs novices, ils sont très, très en difficulté. Par contre, les joueurs de foot, ils sont très à l'aise quand on leur montre un, 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 une vidéo. Par contre, ils sont moins à l'aise, les joueurs de foot, ils sont bien mieux que les novices de H, tous les cas, mais quand on leur montre avec ou sans trace. C'est-à-dire, si je prends un joueur professionnel, il vaut de mieux lui faire un, un, une vidéo que de lui montrer une masse statique. Et par contre, il n'y a pas de différence pour lui, on ne laisse, on laisse pas les traces. Pour quelqu'un qui débute, la dynamique, elle est très compliquée. Après, euh, les, la deuxième, c'est la, la situation où tu n'as pas la trace, c'est-à-dire ça disparaît d'un cran à cran, mais ils sont très à l'aise quand tu leur laisses les traces. Et ils ont la possibilité, regardez, il y a une bonne chose. Conclusion de ce travail, c'est... Euh, ou après, je vais vous montrer une deuxième, comme ça je vais rapidement. Après, on a fait. Donc, vous avez vu que, on a vu que le dynamique, c'était mieux que le, que le statique. Euh, et les, les, les novices, euh, ils préféraient plus les statiques avec des traces que sans traces. Après, on a fait une deuxième étude. On a dit, si on combine le dynamique avec le statique, c'est-à-dire, qu'est-ce qu'on va faire ça, Comme tout à l'heure, le dynamique, les statiques, ici, c'était les experts, c'était meilleur. Ici, c'était les novices qui s'est meilleur. Après, on a créé une autre chose. On bouge les gens, mais on les laisse en place. C'est-à-dire, il y a de dynamique, mais on a laissé des traces. Et on a dit, est-ce que cette situation, qu'est-ce qu'on appelle une situation combinée, peut-être elle va améliorer les performances. Je vais partir directement. C'est une autre population qu'on a testée. Et je pars directement, et je pars directement à... à je, euh, je pars directement au résultat. Le résultat, c'était quoi Donc ici, c'est les statiques. Qu'est-ce qu'on a parlé euh, On laisse les traces. Ça, c'est les dynamiques, c'est la vidéo. Et ça, c'est quand on a combiné les deux choses. Qu'est-ce qu'on observe Que la dynamique, euh, toujours plus, moins, les experts, ils sont là, et les novices, ils sont là. La dynamique chez les experts, toujours, elle est la meilleure. Par, la, la statique chez les novices, elle est toujours la meilleure. Mais par contre, le combiné, quand on met le statique et le dynamique ensemble, regardez, pour les deux populations, ils sont en difficulté. Ça veut dire que cette situation, elle crée beaucoup de charges cognitives. Donc, conclusion, qu'est-ce que euh, on peut conclure de ce travail de recherche qui est très très simple Ça, c'est euh, notre premier étude, ça fait 7-8 ans euh, qu'on a réalisé ça. On, après, je vous montre un petit peu euh, qu'est-ce qu'on est en train de faire actuellement. Donc globalement, qu'est-ce qu'on a montré Que euh, sur le même contenu, euh, l'expert et les novices, euh, ils ne ils, ils apprennent pas la même chose. Imaginez, je vous donne un exemple, vous avez un club de foot, si vous avez tous des experts, il faut mettre dynamique. Si vous avez des joueurs débutants, il faut le mettre statique. Imaginez maintenant, vous avez une équipe qui est mélange, mélange entre les deux. 
Il faut un entraînement un petit peu euh, plus adapté. Cette, euh, cette euh, étude qui est théorique, qui montre, euh, je ne remonte pas dans les, les hypothèses et tout, elle montre aussi euh, aux, autres, aux entraîneurs qui doivent aussi travailler sur ce type de présentation qui est non négligeable pour euh, l'apprentissage parce que ça peut accélérer l'apprentissage de façon très intéressante. Maintenant, euh, pour euh, conclure euh, le travail, actuellement les travaux récents qu'on est en train de mettre, c'est plutôt les outils euh, technologiques qui sont en place actuellement et qui sont, euh, et qui sont euh, donc euh, mon étudiant Hatem, il va déjà travailler sur, il, va, il a déjà publié sur ça et sa thèse c'est pour bientôt. On va vous donner les, les résultats très très prochainement et, et je serai ravi de, de les partager avec les, les jeunes chercheurs ou les collègues qui sont sur place. Maintenant, pour conclure, euh, vu qu'on est en groupe de groupe de d'arabe, donc je souhaite bonne chance à, aux deux équipes qui sont euh, qui sont en finale de la coupe d'arabe et que les deux peuples fêteront la victoire, quel que soit le gagnant. Merci. Merci beaucoup, docteur, de votre, de votre très, très intéressante intervention. Donc, euh, on va essayer de trouver si l'audience des questions. Est-ce qu'il y en a des questions chez l'audience Non Donc, euh, Alors, je passe à une question. Euh, une première question, question j'en ai beaucoup, mais euh, une première. Est-ce que vous... Euh, est-ce que vous... Euh, est-ce que vous... Euh, vous confirmez que euh, chez les footballeurs, il s'agit de, pro, euh, de proposer toujours des situations là où on s'approche réellement de ce que va trouver chez, euh, sur le terrain. Puisque je, je me base sur euh, votre euh, définition de, de, de la conception de comprendre le jeu. Mmh. Normalement, les joueurs sont plus à l'aise dans les situations dynamiques qui sont plus proches du terrain parce que les joueurs qui en termes de fonctionnement, ils fonctionnent par anticipation. Donc ils ont un processus donc dans le cerveau. Euh, quand on est expert, on, on fait euh, la dynamique, ça nous permet de regarder le jeu, mais anticiper qu'est-ce qu'il va faire. Et les joueurs, des fois, ils anticipent, ils peuvent faire des erreurs, et ces erreurs aussi ils vont lui permettre d'apprendre plus vite. Parce que est, il est en termes de valider ou pas valider un petit peu le... Je donne un exemple, si une équipe elle monte, et lui il sait que dans ce cas-là, comment elle doit monter. Donc il, il, il touche, euh, il, il essaye de regarder, mais s'il y a quelque chose qui se modifie, rapidement il la détecte et il la mémorise rapidement pour la changer. Par contre, tout qui est statique, il lui pose problème parce que ça l'oblige de passer par des stades simples. Donc c'est pour cette raison, si vous travaillez avec des joueurs de première division ou des joueurs professionnels, de préférence, il faut euh, mettre des, 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 des vidéos. Mais par contre... Attention, ça c'est seulement pour montrer le format de présentation. Après, il y a d'autres choses. Il faut regarder le, le, le nombre d'informations qu'on donne aux gens dans la, dans la vidéo. Euh, L'angle de vue euh, que l'on propose, parce que tous les autres angles ne donnent pas la même lecture de jeu. Et ça, c'est des travaux qu'on qu a aussi abordés et qu'on a des connaissances euh, comment présenter l'image. Par exemple, quand on présente l'image de là-haut, il y a une vision plus facile quand on le, le, le présente sur le côté. Parce que ça, c est, c est, ça permet, pour, quand on est de haut, on peut contre, construire ce qu'on appelle un modèle mental plus facilement. Vous avez compris ou quoi Il y a le dynamique qui est bien, mais avec le dynamique, il faut attention à l'angle d'information qu'on donne au sujet, l'angle de présentation de, 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 de l'image, et après, il y a d'autres facteurs qu'on peut prendre en considération. Et les processus cognitifs et, euh, qui interviennent dans le programme de la mémoire, l'analyse mmh. et tout ça mmh. les, les processus cognitifs, euh, il faut savoir. Les, euh, pour être un petit peu rapide, euh, il y a deux, deux mémoires qui, qui interviennent. Il y a une mémoire, qu'est-ce qu'on appelle la mémoire à long terme, avec toutes ses composantes, et c'est ici qu'on a des connaissances spécifiques, surtout l'expert, parce que c'est comme les, les gens qui font le jeu d'échecs. 
À force de pratiquer, on va engranger un ensemble de situations, qu'est-ce qu'on appelle des patterns on, on, dans le cerveau. Et ces patterns de, dans le cerveau, ça permet aux joueurs, aux joueurs d'analyser qu'est-ce qu'on appelle toutes les situations. Parce qu'il a des connaissances, parce que le, le, le dans de, dans les de pratique. Par contre, les joueurs qui débutent, ils n'ont pas toutes ces connaissances dans la mémoire à long terme. Ils sont obligés d'utiliser qu'est-ce qu'on appelle la mémoire de travail. Et cette mémoire de travail, elle est limitée. Donc c'est pour cette raison, un novice, quand on lui manque une situation de jeu, déjà, quand on utilise les stratégies de prise d'information visuelle, on voit que les novices suivent le ballon. Quand tu suis le ballon, tu n'arrives pas à avoir une vision globale. Donc tu es en train d'ajouter élément par élément, et ça, ça prend beaucoup de temps à un joueur de construire ce qu'on appelle le modèle mental, c'est comment mettre un schéma de jeu facilement en tête. Par exemple, si je prends le foot, si vous êtes spécialiste en foot, euh, si je prends 4-4-2, un expert, il regarde rapidement 4-4-2. Un joueur débutant, quand tu lui dis, il va te dire, il y a un à droite, un à gauche, deux dans l'axe, il décrit superficiellement. Mais par contre, un expert, il va faire trois catégories, dépendance milieu de euh, truc, et pour lui, il a compris. Après, si on bouge un élément, il, il peut coder. Il a codé, par exemple, le, le 4-4-2 en losange, à plat, il a le, le codage. Mais l'autre, il n'a pas de codage. Donc, comme il n'a pas de codage, donc il n'a pas assez de connaissance de regarder le match ou analyser le match ou euh, comprendre le match de façon très, très, très euh, facilement. Et actuellement, on est sur d'autres euh, processus d'ici peu de temps. Vous aurez quelques papiers qui vont sortir euh, sur cette notion, par exemple, comme la, la capacité visuo-spatiale, qui est un facteur déterminant aussi, c'est les experts, pour être plus performants euh, que uniquement les bases de connaissances que j'ai citées tout à l'heure. Merci, euh, merci docteur. Je passe le, 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 le parole à docteur euh, Anisha Weshi. Monsieur Bachir, merci beaucoup pour euh, cette présentation euh, assez riche et didactique, bien sûr. Euh, on vous suit de, 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 pas réellement de près, mais on vous suit un peu, parce que c'est un axe un peu qui n'est pas encore très, très développé en Tunisie et j'espère que les étudiants ici présents euh, ont pu. Euh, un peu retenir quelques, quelques idées pour euh, des, des études futures et, et voilà si le chien est à votre disposition aussi pour des teasers pour euh, éventuelle euh, collaboration. Moi je vais parler un peu de la visibilité de ces travaux aussi le chien par rapport à, à, à Midline donc euh, moi personnellement quelqu'un qui cherche toujours de l'information mais je vois que il n'y a pas encore assez peut-être de vulgarisation ou de revue de, de, de littérature qui, pour les, le consommateur de l'information, euh, mm -hmm. va réellement euh, comprendre l'intérêt, l'intérêt un peu de ces détails parce que la performance est multifactorielle. Et il mm -hmm. faut ne pas euh, focaliser seulement sur le psychologique ou seulement sur euh, le physiologique. On reste euh, un peu loin de la haute, euh, de la haute performance. Donc, y a-t-il un peu par rapport à, à cette visibilité des, je sais pas, des, euh, des idées pour euh, comment, comment euh, mieux vendre ce produit au niveau euh, cognitif D'accord. Euh, en tous les cas, je vous remercie aussi. Je suis très très content parce que j'ai toujours un, un attache particulier pour le peuple tunisien. Donc, euh, parce que j'ai pas mal d'étudiants qui sont avec moi, qui se font dans ce taxe, et, et toujours, ça met à... J'ai pas mal aussi d'amis euh, que je croise de temps en temps dans les congrès. Et c'est vrai pour... Euh, mais, mais ça, euh, je vous rassure, euh, c'est pas uniquement au niveau Tunisie. Euh, Qu'est-ce qu'on euh, est en train de faire euh, C'est vraiment euh, quelque chose qui dit euh, ça fait pas longtemps qu'il a, qu a démarré. Moi, j'ai commencé... Avant, sur la prise de décision, il y avait quelques personnes, mais depuis qu'on travaille sur euh, qu ce qu'on appelle les supports multimédia et les nouvelles technologies, c'est des, euh, des sciences très récentes et surtout, euh, surtout sur la cognition. Qu'est-ce que vous dites, la cognition On a écrit quelques, euh, quelques articles de vulgarisation à grand public. Euh, bah, j'ai présenté tout à l'heure le, le livre en, que j'ai euh, redirigé, euh, j'ai dirigé en, en 2009, où j'ai écrit avec Hubert Ripoll sur l'apport de l'image la compréhension et l'amélioration de la performance tactique chez les joueurs. Euh, J'ai écrit aussi dans une revue euh, euh, qui s'appelle Psycho et Cerveau et Psychologie, qui est une revue très connue ici en, en France, vous la trouvez sur Internet, mais je peux vous donner des, des articles. On essaie de vulgariser à monsieur et à tout le monde, euh, c'est quoi 
ce troisième facteur, parce que euh, normalement, en performance, comme vous avez dit, il y a l'apprentissage moteur, il y a tout euh, le développement euh, physiologique, il y a la pratique mentale que actuellement il y a beaucoup de gens qui, qui essaient de, de greffer ici, mais malheureusement, ça aussi sur ce point-là, euh, les gens, euh, des fois, ils ne sont pas aussi spécialistes que ça, mais comme le, le, le milieu, il est, euh, parce qu'on n'a pas beaucoup de connaissances réelles, scientifiques, je parle scientifiquement, hein, ce n'est pas quelque chose de... Et après, il y a toute la partie, qu'est-ce qu'on appelle euh, la cognition, c'est la cognition, c'est comment... Euh, comme les pratiques de, 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 de foot collectif, comment les gens, on peut accélérer leur apprentissage en utilisant les nouvelles technologies. Et, et c'est vrai, on ne peut pas euh, aider les personnes pour développer ces recherches si on ne vulgarise pas. Et ça, c'est un travail qu'il euh, faut de la, des forces. Maintenant, on commence à avoir des étudiants des arts qui sortent chez nous. On a publié en anglais mais ça reste, c'est pour cela qu'aujourd'hui, je n'ai pas voulu faire quelque chose de plus scientifique, pointu, parce que pour moi, c'est réducteur comme axe. Je voulais sensibiliser les jeunes, parce que je sais que vous avez une grosse communauté de jeunes qui sont, qui sont très actifs, pour dire, écoutez, si vous voulez faire la recherche, il faut voir plus, plus grand et plus large. Et plus grand, c'est... Actuellement, la science, elle se développe. Cet axe sur la condition, il se développe. Il est très important parce qu'on doit comprendre le cerveau, comment il fonctionne, comment on peut, euh, ce qu'on appelle les interactions en machine. Et la machine, elle va être de plus en plus importante. Et même, euh, je vais vous dire une chose, il y a beaucoup de choses qui vont changer. Par exemple, euh, si je sors un petit peu de sujet, l'intelligence artificielle, elle va prendre un, 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 un axe très, très, très fort pour, pour, pour comprendre penser les limites fonctionnelles du système cognitif de l'homme et il y a des gens, même beaucoup de gens qui sont en train de travailler sur ça et deuxième chose qui est importante c'est euh, essayer de, de partir, qu'est-ce que je leur souhaite aussi, de partir sur des petits articles que je peux envoyer, je peux donner des, des références pour comprendre les B.A.B.A. de la condition. Les B.A.B.A. de la condition sont très très simples, il y a quatre théories qui sont très très simples, la, la théorie de, de Badley sur la mémoire, comment elle est organisée la théorie de la charge cognitive de Sweller, qui explique pourquoi les contenus sont difficiles. La théorie du multimédia de Mayer, elle est, elle, elle est importante. Et la théorie de l'expertise. Ces quatre théories, ces quatre théories qu'on peut trouver, mais il faut additionner, additionner à chercher ici, à rester ici. C'est vrai, un, un, un enseignant qui est spécialiste dans le domaine, il peut facilement synthétiser tout ça pour aider les, les gens à travailler sur ces axes et qui sont très importantes. Et pour terminer, je vous dis, euh, dans le futur, euh, le, les gains des compétitions, il va dépendre du de, de développement des sciences et de ces nouvelles technologies, quel que soit le domaine. Quel que soit les, quel que soit les domaines, et tous les pays qu'on a, par exemple, quand ils vont participer aux comp euh, compétitions, surtout, qu'est-ce qu'on voit actuellement dans les, la Coupe d'Arabe, le temps, il est limité. L'entraîneur, il ne fait pas d'entraînement de, physique. C'est-à-dire toute la partie technologique, elle va compenser pour comprendre, analyser le jeu. On voit que maintenant, que les entraîneurs ils font deux fois la vidéo. Mais je vous rassure une chose, que ces vidéos, ils sont gérés par des gens qui sont techniciens. Ce n'est pas des chercheurs. Et ça ne suffit pas qu'on coupe les images pour donner aux joueurs, pour comprendre les situations. Maintenant qu'on a des connaissances sur l'animation, sur, euh, sur la présentation de l'image, le contenu à, à, à faire et faire même un diagnostic, un diagnostic sur les... Our cycle we have, um, there are quite numerous other modulators, or we probably also would say, at least in a training uh, experiment or in a training study perspective, we'd say maybe confounding factors, but there are numerous modulators which will change, dampen, maybe increase the effects uh, we want to establish by a certain type of training. Uh, just to give you some ideas, of course, activities of daily living, being passive, more passive or active, of course, or um, inactivity, of course, will alter um, uh, physiological variables over time. We know sleep has a great influence on adaptation as well as various recovery procedures influence adaptation over time. Of course, nutrition 
how and when and what we eat before, in and after a training session influences the outcome, <clears throat> as well as environmental factors like ultraviolet radiation, heat, altitude exposure, cold, ozone, particulate matter, and of course noise. Uh, the timing of training is important when you train in the morning, in the evening, um, how you engage with other people, with uh, your coach, with family, with friends, with sponsors, of course, influences uh, hormonal responses, for example, and from there on also um, other, um, uh, other subsystems in the body, alcohol, drugs, doping, and surely um, numerous other factors uh, I haven't listed here, but all these together, um, this is what I would call a free living exercising biology. And uh, just my opinion or just the view or how I read articles, we're focusing on these four hours of training or two hours of training and are really deep into analyzing this type of exercise. but. I'm quite certain um, we're ne neglecting a very big part uh, or an influencing part when it comes especially to elite athletes. I will come back to this chart at the very end of my presentation. It will look a little bit different, but um, based on this, pre or on this slide here, I will try to give a little bit of an overview of what I would call personalized training or a personalized training process. Another information I think is important to know is that um, elite athletes, and this is an example of German elite rowers here, um, show a quite significant time of inactivity during weekdays and uh, during the weekend. And just to give you a number uh, on the analysis we performed several years ago, uh, it seems that elite rowers have about 11 to 12 hours of complete inactivity. And um, just from a training science perspective, this is interesting because we know that inactivity blunts or alters um, uh, physiological responses. Um, but we also know that a certain type of inactivity also might improve recovery. So the question is, these 12 hours of exercise or uh, of non-exercise, how should they or how should this time be, uh, be used um, in the end? And that's uh, something I will show you later on, just some considerations I have at least for this, uh, uh, this blue area here. But and that's an important analysis. If we look at free time activity, and I will come back to the free time activity later as well, uh, there's about a half an hour of very high intensity uh, activity involved in the free time activities of these elite um, um, athletes. But the coaches are not aware of this very high intensity exercise. So the question is, are we maybe a little bit neglecting a very important area of information in order to understand um, the exercise induced adaptation over time? Uh, just to come back a little bit to personalized, and if we, if we look at the term personalized, of course, genetics or genes and trainability play a role, but maybe not as much as we would, um, we would assume. Uh, these are two, um, uh, two studies, uh, one study on the left side more in, uh, uh, in, in less trained um, participants and on the right side more in elite, uh, in an elite population. And it seems if we look at VO2 max adaptation or trainability, it seems that a, a gene constellation, that there might be a certain type of gene constellation explaining uh, maybe about 50% of the variance for VO2 max trainability. And this is, or it seems to be true for both for the less trained and for the highly trained population. So genetics, of course, plays a role, but it's, it's in the end, it's not the destiny of a, of a per person. There's still a large um, uh, um, possibility just by behaving or by differently behaving, by exercising, to induce certain phenotypes who would like to have 
um, depending on the sport. <clears throat> and coming to the different sports, if we um, discuss personalized training and if we, if we see a study, let's say in rowing, and uh, we would like to take maybe some take home messages to other sports, uh, I just like to highlight that I personally believe that it's not quite, um, it's not the best approach maybe to, to compare uh, different training studies from different sports just because the loading, for example, here on the left side, if we look into rowing or into a sport, uh, which body weight does not play that much of a role when compared, for example, to rowing, then the loading, the muscular loading, is um, quite completely different just because of the more eccentric component you will have in, or you, you see in running. And, uh, and this means, in the end, uh, if we take running as a role model, there will only be a certain amount of specific training time, of running time per week involved just because the loading is so high and runners um, might um, uh, might uh, basically might run into uh, in, into injuries. So the amount of training time in running will be clearly less compared, for example, to rowing, to cycling, or to cross country skiing. So, and if we talk about personalized training, then of course we need to take this into account. But also, if we want to compare the outcomes from, let's say, a rowing study, and maybe try to transfer. Um, um, the knowledge into other sports, I believe we have to be careful on that side. Then one study I've been, uh, I've been wondering about uh, quite long is uh, actually a very nice, interesting study. Uh, it's on the reproducibility of, of an outcome. And uh, this group here, they perform four weeks of uh, high intensity interval training. Um, had a washout phase of three months and repeated the exact same study once more. And the aim of the study was just to see if the, um, if the values or if the, the changes, for example, in peak oxygen uptake can be reproduced over time. And as we can see from just the correlation analysis from period one to period two in the increase in peak oxygen uptake, we clearly see um, there is no real good correlation involved. So uh, the group here concluded um, that it seems quite um, uncertain that an identical training stimuli will produce the exact same values once more. And if we look into personalized training, this of course is important because one message, at least on a, on a mean level, is that if we do one type of, um, of training or a certain period of training and we reproduce the same um, training, let's say maybe a year later or two years later, the results not necessarily will be the same. And that, I believe, is very important, especially if we look at predefined training schedules, which is uh, often quite common also on the elite level. And then this is just uh, because this is a scientific um, conference here, I just want to highlight a little bit uh, a, a critical view to the training science studies I've been reading and I've also conducted um, uh, in my lab, is just the, the view that most of the training studies we have, if we comp compare a treatment A to a treatment B or a training experiment uh, one to experiment two, then usually we have between group comparisons. And I really don't read that many crossover studies. And I personally believe if we want to, um, if we want to have a, a deeper knowledge in adaptation, in the mechanisms involved, we need more crossover studies. And definitely, um, um, and that's something our lab is looking into, I personally believe we also need more replication studies just in order to be more certain that a certain training period <coughs> will induce a certain type of adaptation. Uh, Meta-analysis uh, won't help. 
I don't believe on uh, in this area. I personally think or believe that the replication studies are more important in this case than meta-analysis. Uh, meta uh, also, um, just to highlight, a, um, uh, let's say half of our global population, um, and if we look at the male versus um, female um, studies, uh, which have been conducted in uh, with the search term endurance exercise and female or and male, then we see the ratio male to female um, type of publication is about in 1.5. So we have clearly more information in male endurance athletes compared to female endurance athletes. And um, a lot of the more general assumptions or conclusions uh, we gather from a training science study uh, most probably uh, will not be transferable, for example, from a male population to a female female population. And I believe that's also important um, to have in mind when we talk about personalized training or personalized um, training yeah, science. So if I uh, summarize my first, um, my, my first start here, uh, the presentation, and we come back to this 24-hour cycle, and we have a certain area which I, uh, or a time, which of course is dedicated to training, different types of training. <clears throat> and if I break down maybe the most important areas in, uh, the, uh, in the other time, in the other, let's say, off training time, then I think we can, um, we can summarize, um, let's say, uh, activities into more behavior. So how is sleep behavior? How do you handle, let's say, small injuries or major injuries? How do you uh, recover? Um, uh, yeah, so that, that's one area. How do you behave more or less? Of course, the big area of nutrition, uh, which could be added to behavior, but I think it's that important, at least for endurance athletes. So. Um, here in this chart, I highlighted it as a, um, as a single, uh, single factor here. Of course, everything uh, around nutrition, of course, mindset uh, is a very important area. The environment, not only uh, terrestrial environment, but, but also psycho-social uh, interaction, of course, uh, is a certain type of environment as well. And everything around uh, technology and ergonomics plays a, a major role. So this is a little bit, uh, I call it the big six, um, I believe is our important components when we talk, or when I will talk later on, for personalized training process. And to summarize, <clears throat> training from my perspective is a 24-hour process which has many modulators. Um, athletes so, show substantial inactivity, um, which of course then automatically will have an influence on uh, training outcome. Genes explain about 50% of the VO2 peak trainability. Loading will diff or differs between endurance sports, and it seems, at least from a VO2 peak perspective, that there is a poor re reproducibility of the ATP adaptation. And I think we need more knowledge in female athletes in order to provide more personalized recommendations, at least for the female athlete. So in the second part of my presentation, I first I will um, focus on some training aspects, which uh, um, which I believe are important for endurance athletes. And then after um, uh, a short conclusion from, uh, from this area, I will go a little bit into more of the behavior area because I think that's the next field, at least in training science, uh, in order to understand more personalized training process. So let's have a look at, um, <clears throat> at training or training um, uh, intensity distribution. And as you may know, uh, or as I initially said, a, an elite athlete roughly has about 100 or 1,000 hours of training per year. And um, after a while, um, 
the time or um, the intensity distribution of training over time becomes very important when training time becomes more or less limited. So that's a little bit the starting and what do I mean by intensity distribution and others, um, other colleagues um, as well have uh, proposed similar models, different models, uh, maybe even five, uh, five zone models. Uh, today I will just highlight a very simple one, a three zone model, which has been around at least in endurance training for now a longer period of time. And if uh, an endurance athlete, and it really doesn't matter if this is cycling, running, or uh, even swimming, um, you, can, <clears throat> you can define certain benchmarks or certain boundaries. And from these uh, specific boundaries or physiological benchmarks, you then can define uh, in this model here th three different zones. Others have termed this, um, let's say this partitioning as domains, that's fine as well. Um, I don't want to give these special zones a name, so I've called them zone one, zone two, and zone three. And uh, if, if, if an athlete would run in zone one in this exercise intensity zone, he or she would feel this intensity as moderate or as easy in zone two and as intense or heavy and in zone three is uh, very intense. And from this model on, uh, you can predefine different, um, let's say, strategies or uh, processes. If you, let's say, emphasize more on zone one, you probably would call this more basic endurance or uh, clear aerobic exercise. You also can plan or, um, <clears throat> Yeah, plan your training more in zone three. This is uh, most probably then executed as high intensity interval training. You can combine different zones, zone one, two, and three as a so-called polarized um, model. And uh, a different, let's say more older models maybe uh, emphasizing zone two is a more threshold training and they're now, other models as well discussed like pyramidal um, training intensity distribution with a high amount of zone one, less in zone two, and the least in zone three. So these are the different types of uh, intensity distribution um, models. Oh, if we... Um, if we uh, then look in, a, in an experiment uh, we conducted about seven, eight years ago, um, if we engage different endurance athletes with a, let's say, um, higher peak, not elite, but a higher uh, peak oxygen uptake of uh, above 60 milliliters per minute per kg for nine weeks, in these different models here, um, <clears throat> then what we see is um, it seems to be that there is at least a, let's say, a clear or a clearer um, or more significant uh, improvement in VO2 peak when these athletes engage in a mix of more basic endurance and high intensity interval training. So this is about the gain you will see, um, the, the mean average gain you will see in, um, in this performance level over nine weeks of exercise. After that study, we were quite curious uh, how, other, um, how other elite athletes in, in various sports, how they uh, distribute their zone one, zone two, and zone three uh, exercise. And in this review here in 2015, we divided various sports into uh, at least what we could define their preparation period, pre-competition period, and competition period. And as you can see, there are only, at that time, there were only five um, studies uh, showing a more or less polarized training approach. Usually, uh, the training intensity distribution uh, shows a very high zone in zone one, 
less than zone two and typically less than zone three. So um, this was the first, let's say, overview on the training intensity distribution of different sports and in different time times throughout um, the season. But in 2015, at that time, we definitely we could not identify, let's say, um, at least from different studies that uh, polarized training intensity distribution was more, let's say, obvious in these um, in these sports and in others. And then we were quite curious because um, the term polarized is not totally or is not clearly defined in the literature. And Gunnar uh, Treff was uh, so keen and he, uh, he, he, uh, he defined a little bit what we call a polarization index. And the polarization index basically is a, uh, um, a mathematical model or is a modeling on how we would define a polarization. And the polarization index in the end quite uh, clearly shows how far um, or but basically the amount of zone one compared to zone three in comparison to zone two. That's basically a little bit the message behind um, the polarization index. And the interesting part is that if we look at studies which were published at that time, and if we look at the training intensity distribution and the polarization index, and we define a polarization index above two to be polarized, um, the interesting part is that authors who have uh, termed their study as polarized, in the end actually were not polarized. So uh, we believe that this polarization index at least helps a little bit to identify more polarized training intensity distributions compared um, <clears throat> to, let's say, non-polarized or more pyramidal training intensity distributions. And from there on, um, we've been using the polarization index and others uh, in their studies as well, because it helps a little bit of explaining um, the distribution over time. And uh, the polarization index is, or we believe is quite important because this is a study, uh, actually a long, longer study, 11 weeks in, um, in uh, elite rowers. And what we wanted to know is, um, is there a difference or what are the physiological and performance differences over time if athletes engage in a more pyramidal um, distribution um, and what happens if they let's say engage in a more polarized training intensity distribution over time and here on this side you can see the weekly polarization index at least on the mean level and the interesting part is although we plan a pyramidal uh, training intensity distribution over time the coach, when um, when entering into competition season or when the first qualification um, championships start, the coaches automatically tend to a greater polarization, meaning they add more zone two or zone three training intensity to the training. And at least for a certain period of time, we actually we achieved our goal of, uh, let's say, having a polarized group and a pyramidal group. But if we look at real life training, uh, then we clearly see that there is a certain type of tapering involved. And with the tapering involvement, you have more zone three involvement as well. So when analyzing this type of studies, you have to be aware that maybe on a mean level, if we look here, uh, you might be able to compose two completely different training intensity distributions for two different groups. But it might happen that over time, there will be a shift in the zone. So we believe that uh, the weekly analysis over time is more important than summarizing a certain period, let's say a mesocycle of four, five, six, eight weeks, 
because um, there's more information involved if you have a higher resolution than combining everything in, into one study. And the outcome from that study was that if we look on, uh, on each individual here, and these were really highly trained uh, rowing athletes, and if we look at the development of the 2,000 meter rowing time, uh, then on a mean level, we could not really see a clear difference between the polarized and the, uh, and the pyramidal training intensity distribution. But, of course, you always have outliers in, these, um, in this analysis. So just from the, let's say, hard traditional statistical analysis, we couldn't find a clear difference. But if you look at the polarization index, and plot the polarization index uh, to the two kilometer uh, or the change in two kilometer time over 11 weeks, then you can identify um, uh, athletes with a clear increase, or at least we'll have a, a study which has performed uh, different types of training intensity distributions, maybe during uh, preparation period one, preparation period two, and competition phase and you will have a certain distribution over time. And on the left side here, you see the training intensity distribution of quite highly trained uh, kayakers in, uh, in Germany. And just from the mean training intensity distribution here in preparation period one, uh, there's a clear pyramidal um, training intensity distribution. But if you look at each athlete um, for this preparation, period one, you see a quite clear individual uh, difference between each athlete. So personally, I believe if we look into personalized training or personalized training, maybe even analysis, I don't think the mean values here will help us because there's a clear intra-individual variation over time. And that's also true for different phases over uh, the time and also for the competition period. So um, <clears throat> if we look into personalized training, and that's a little bit the message here, I just want to highlight that we need to zoom in um, and into, um, into what happens week by week and for athlete by athlete, and the mean approach won't help us here at all because it's, uh, it does not reflect each athlete at a time. And <clears throat> this is also true if we look over time for a longer period of time, you see, although these athletes train in a, in a similar training group, the training intensity distribution over time is quite different between athletes. <clears throat> and I, uh, I personally, I like these type of analysis on the right side because they clearly show the inter-individual variation among the athletes. And putting everything together, like say in a three month block, um, is um, I think not really informative, at least if we want to uh, understand the combination of training intensity distribution and a physiological outcome or performance outcome. Um, I just want to highlight, this is also a new study coming out quite soon. Um, we also looked into the training intensity distribution in kayakers as well, but um, we looked into the quantification method as well. Others have, um, have done similar analysis. So if you quantify the training intensity by blood lactate, heart rate, or race pace, you will get a clearly different analysis over time. And um, Manuel Matska, he's a PhD student in my group, he quite nicely, I think, um, um, assessed or concluded that depending on uh, the period of, of time, on if you're more in a competition period, if you're more in a preparation period, then actually it could be quite interesting even shifting from a more blood lactate or heart rate based quantification method to a more race based um, quantification method. That's at least just to be aware of that if we talk about training intensity distribution, of course, we need to also talk a little bit about the quantification method as well. 
wrong direction. So to summarize this, uh, this area of training so far, um, I, can, I can conclude that the training intensity distribution differs quite enormously between athletes and also between different sports and of course in the season. And so far, I have not identified an optimal training intensity distribution. So far, um, at least on an individual level, maybe more on the mean level, that might be possible, but that also depends on the sports and on the performance level. And just to be clear, if we talk about personalized training, then the results from the mean training intensity distribution studies does not reflect uh, or most certainly will not reflect the individual training intensity distribution. And it, um, it is, at least from my experience, that athletes automatically will tend to a more polarized uh, training intensity distribution when they come or when they face more of the competition season. And of course, it depends on the sports as well. <clears throat> it might be that at least for some athletes, and uh, I know at least in rowing, that a clear polarization, uh, uh, clearly above polarization index of uh, 2.0, might, might be necessary, uh, necessary for significant improvements, at least in, in rowing. And I know there are many quantification methods. Um, they, they differ and um, we need to be aware of these quantification methods because the analysis and the interpretation afterwards is highly affected, of course, by the quantification method as well. So this was my part now for training um, and how can this information help us maybe to guide more uh, personalized training? Well, um, I'd add a little bit more on information, um, uh, let's say training information, but also uh, some information from uh, the behavior side. And in, on, on this perspective, I'd like to add, uh, especially the training intensity distribution during the waking hours. I've called, or we've called this term off training. And I believe it's a very, very important component if we want to understand the adaptation, uh, physiological adaptation over time. Also, or not only in sedentary, um, in a sedentary population, but also, or maybe even especially, in elite athletes. Just to give you uh, a short idea on how we quantify training intensity distribution uh, during uh, off training. Um, this is a, uh, a simple chart. This is a female runner. Uh, the runner here engaged in a high intensity interval training, uh, which is highlighted in red here. And if you look at the entire heart rate kinetic of this runner over the 24 hour cycle, you will see some uh, lower cardiorespiratory response here, uh, low heart rates during the day, higher heart rates, and in the end, uh, in the end of the day, also um, the typical up and down in the heart rate kinetics over time. But the interesting part here is, uh, if you look at the heart rate kinetics, you will identify in this female runner. Um, a certain peak or time this person engages in actually higher cardiorespiratory load. And my question was, how does this information or does this additional cardiorespiratory load here add up to the, uh, let's say, adaptation, cardiorespiratory adaptation we would imagine over time? So I will show you uh, up. And uh, this is this is possible just by, uh, let's say, identifying different zones here. This is not a three zone model, but a multiple zone model just based on the peak heart rate here. And in the next two slides, you will see a more red, more yellow, and more blue color. And just be aware that the more red color 
will uh, will reflect an intensity closer to uh, 90 or 80 to 90 to 100 percent of peak heart rate yellow color more to 60 to 70 percent and the blue color is uh, below 60 percent of peak heart rate and this is a, a study we published um, two three years ago uh, on a uh, on a training science uh, study but actually at that time we only published the results of this upper area here and um, just to navigate you through this slide these are two runners runner number one on the left side runner number two on the right side and this runner improved vo2 peak by 3.2 percent over about four months and this runner improved VO2 peak by about 6% over this period of time. And the interesting part here is um, we have different training sessions with the training intensity distribution, the more red, the higher the intensity, the more yellow, blue, the lower the intensity. And the loading, the training load defined by TRIMP analysis uh, was uh, similar a little bit a different sequence but that's i think not the information we need now <clears throat> so the trip the loading was the same but if you look at the waking time so this is this chart here is the waking time of this person without adding this information here so you see some little red dots sometime this person has invested or engaged in a higher intensity um, a higher intensity activity, at least increasing um, cardiac uh, cardiac response on this side, and uh, a clearly different pattern with more orange and clearly more red um, area here, and, and percentage of higher intensity exercise involvement on this side here. So this person, although they trained with the similar training load. This person here has a clearly different waking time or waking uh, activity behavior over time. And the chart down here basically is your training plus the waking hour. And um, this is on a 24 hour cycle. This is the heart rate response of this person without sleeping time. We excluded the sleeping time in this analysis here. And if we look, just on mean values day by day, this runner engaged in about 3% of the entire waking time above 60% of peak heart rate. And if we look at runner number two, this runner here almost engaged in five times more or had five times higher cardiorespiratory loading over time. And uh, just on a day by day analysis, this person engaged in about 14% of waking uh, of his or her waking time above 60% of peak heart rate. And the question now is, can we, does, um, do we need to alter free time activity or does this person maybe need this time for recovery? But the more interesting part for me is now with this information on the, on the bottom area here, we can identify more, this is what we call the, the periodization maybe <clears throat> over time. We can identify the ups and downs and uh, we might be able or we're able to analyze maybe the interaction of training and free time activity. So this is just an example from a beginner, uh, for my normal everyday runner. I'd like to show you um, an example of elite rowers this chart it's the exact same analysis on the upper um, uh, area here we have the day by day training sessions um, this is training session on water and ergometer but no strength training analysis involved here both rowers rower one uh, an elite rower rower number two elite rower and as you can see from the waking hours these rowers have completely different um, intensity distribution in their waking hour over time. So this is what we probably would call a couch potato on the left side and on the right side, we have uh, enormous free time activity. Uh, we don't know 
how and what this athlete engaged in, but what I know is that the coach of this rower is not aware of this free time activity. And if we then do a training intensity distribution analysis just based on the training, um, on, on this information on the upper side, then I personally believe we're neglecting a very large information, um, especially when it comes to training adaptation over time. And just from the hard, uh, hard uh, values here, the rower on the left side engaged in 14% of the daily time or of his time above 60% of peak heart rate. And whereas the other rower almost doubled the time uh, above 60% of peak heart rate. So the question now from my side is, is it important? Do we need to change free time activity? Or we also could maybe ask the question, if this is an elite athletic behavior, like kind of like uh, training you know, or during training on and after training basically off in terms of activity, does this rower maybe need the time to recover? But then, of course, we can ask the question on the right side, um, is this rower maybe not having enough recovery time? Or when does this rower actually recover? Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's, uh, that's one important question. And for me, because we've been discussing optimal periodization patterns over time, if in theory, we accept that we need a certain time of progression in training stimulus or training intensity over time. We then would assume that with beginning of preparation period and the ending or the starting of the competition period, we would see more red color over time and less blue. But so far, at least uh, the analysis I've been uh, doing in, uh, in, in different sports, in, in different national teams as well. I've personally, I've never seen an increase in the red zone over time. I've always seen variations and very personalized um, <clears throat> variations over time, but I've never seen a certain block, um, then more blue, and then uh, uh, again, an increase, as you, you might see just from periodization models in, in some textbooks. I've never seen this type of periodization, but now we can ask the question, is there a specific pattern which could be interesting, um, at least for this rower? Uh, and do we see an exact same pattern in this rower? or? A question could be, does this rower on the left side need to adapt more to this, um, uh, to this type of, uh, of behavior or the other way around? So as you can see, if we just analyze training and if we're really looking into training sessions and try to connect uh, the dose and the response of the training, and if we neglect this very, very important uh, information here, I, I'm quite certain we will always find variations in our primary outcome, but that's not connected so much maybe to genetics. It's just because we neglect um, about 20 hours of a 24 hour cycle, at least in elite athletes. So this is just to give you a little bit an overview on how personalized a training process can be just from if we look at rowers and if we look at endurance and cardiovascular adaptation over time. And I'd like to um, just highlight this study here and Guna, Guna Treff, in, at least in rowing, he nicely summarized these findings and he showed how important it is to look at training intensity distribution, but also in off-training intensity distribution because the off-training intensity distribution significantly or might significantly influence or alter the overall training intensity distribution of this person. So I'd like to um, conclude or summarize my presentation um, 
from at least two aspects I've shown you today. First of all, I believe, I, I strongly believe, um, especially with the new technology available, and uh, Peter Dücking this afternoon, he will have a talk on wearable technology. I've been engaging in wearable technology because I personally believe we need more information if we want to analyze the dose-response relationship uh, to endurance exercise. And if we look at these big six uh, components into training, behavior, nutrition, mindset, environment, and technology ergonomics, uh, of course we need, um, if we go into this personalized process, we need a certain type of monitoring. I don't want to discuss which type of monitoring is better than others, which technology and so on. The basic information I want to give to you is we need more information um, in order to provide a certain decision, especially on a day-by-day -day basis to an athlete. And this decision then will lead to a certain type of action, but not only in the area of training, but also in the area of behavior, nutrition, mindset, environment, and um, maybe application of certain technologies. And if you can uh, repeat the cycle over and over, day by day by day, after a while you will hopefully have the adaptation you're targeting or uh, you're aiming for. Um, but over time, if you repeat this type of cycle over and over, you then will get a personalized periodization model for this type of athlete at that time of life, at that time of the season, and so on. And I think the periodization, and I strongly believe the periodization, in the end is a conclusion of repeating the cycle. And I don't think it should be a a priori uh, before uh, or a predefined let's say, pattern, because on a day-by-day -day basis, you will have alterations in the decision-making anyhow, just because of sick days, of injury, of bad weather, and so on. And by repeating the cycle, you then will have a certain type of periodization, which if we go through the cycle, after a while, we will have a personalized process. And as long as the decisions here are more or less based on evidence-based findings on, um, on experience and maybe a little bit on, on gut feeling as well, then I believe we will get closer to a certain personalized um, process. Oh, um, to end, if you want or if you like, please uh, download the PDF at www.sportsandscience.de. If you have any questions, um, please get into contact uh, with me. And if you want, or if you like, you can give me some feedback. Just uh, use the scan here, and uh, you'll have a short questionnaire. And you can give me some feedback on the presentation. And for all others, um, I wish you all Merry Christmas and um, all the best for uh, the next year. Thank you. Presentation a lot of data, of course, a lot of work uh, to, to have uh, this uh, data summarized uh, and in a take home uh, message. So, uh, I would have some maybe some uh, small question, of course, uh, as uh, the practitioner, the coach always are uh, looking for uh, a recommendation based on uh, evidence-based approach, as we know. So, uh, until now, I think uh, all what we have in science are based on spontaneous uh, working from the coach. So, as a scientist, we go and we collect data. But to what extent now uh, we believe that what coach do with elite athletes are uh, really uh, scientific-based or correct? Yes. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a tough question to answer. Um, uh, first of all, the, the mean values we have, 
is a certain type of information we can use, we can harvest. Uh, we can maybe identify, um, uh, let's say, certain best practices, but uh, as a coach, you have to be aware that these, well, let's say, evidence-based recommendations are not necessarily true for every athlete. So you always have to be a little bit skeptical uh, um, uh, if, if, you, if you use the mean value approach, if I, if I call it that way. Um, and then it's a little bit try and error. Um, I don't have any other conclusion so far, uh, try and error. Um, also the involvement of experience, uh, how, we, how, how much do I know of this athlete? Uh, and then, of course, a, a certain day-by-day -day gut feeling as well. Of course, you can use monitoring systems, and you should apply uh, these monitoring systems. But in the end, it'll be a um, a day-by-day -day decision made on three components: uh, evidence-based, experience, and a little bit gut feeling. Okay, we have uh, another question from uh, Professor Hamdi Shturu. Uh, so you can see it directly on the chat. He, the question is based on the data you showed. It seems that waking time is a crucial element that should take it into consideration. Yes, absolutely. Uh, um, wait, please. I am not okay. So the question is: What kind of activities could be done during the waking time, and what about the risk of overtraining if waking time activity exceeds a certain? Liver yes. that can be tolerated by the body. <clears throat> yeah, that's uh, and now we're in the personalized approach. Um, I cannot answer that. Um, I cannot answer that question completely. Um, it it might be uh, that by adding additional, let's say, training or free time activity or additional training sessions, uh, we're facing or we're uh, forcing um, athletes to maybe a little bit more injuries that could happen, but for for that matter, we have monitoring systems. That's the one side. And on the other side, um, it could be that just the one rower, if you remember the rower on the right side, it, it might be the information for the coach just to reduce the amount of activity during free time uh, activity. So, Currently, that's the state now, December 16th, 2021. <laughs> I cannot answer that question, but what I know is we need the information on free time activity if we want to analyze the effects of training intensity distribution and a primary outcome. Uh, I cannot tell you completely what to do, but I know we need the information because um, we have so much variation in the outcome. And we link the variation to genetics. But if, if we neglect the free time activity, I personally believe uh, we're not doing a, a really good job. And five years ago, this information was not possible to access, but with wearable technology, it's, in increasingly improving and easily to access the data. So that's a little bit the message I want to give. I cannot, I, I really cannot tell you, but what I know is I need the information in order to provide, um, let's say, a decision I want to, uh, or an action I want to, to give, or a decision I want to give to an athlete. So that's a little bit maybe the answer, a long answer to a short question. Uh, thank you. In fact, this was the question uh, by our colleague uh, Henry Shader from the post uh, University. I have another question from the same university, from the same lab, from uh, Dr. Lach Priest. So, first he said, great presentation. And he has two small questions. Why polarize index of two? So, this first uh, one. And uh, second question, do you have any information on when or how to combine strength training with polarized continuous training? Okay, the, the one question I can answer, uh, polarization index above two, that's a little bit arbitrary. 
uh, of course, but uh, I, I would need to extend a little bit my answer, but I, I'd like to refer, refer more to the, uh, to the publication from Guna. Um, he has one, two, three, I think quite good rationals why to use 2.0 as a as a cut off and of course it's it's arbitrary a little bit that's uh, that's for sure so maybe that's the answer to uh, the polarization index and the number two is a um, let's say the next step we need to go is on how can we analyze how can we integrate especially in rowing for example as a as a role model for endurance and strength uh, sport how can we combine endurance and strength training uh, of course Heart rate is a poor indicator for loading. If, if, we're, if we're looking to strength training, we would need to add additional. Uh, we would need to add additional, let's say maybe other uh, information or a, a, a next level of information involvement in there. But uh, to answer Olaf's question, uh, I have no clue so far on how to do that. Um, we can use maybe session RPE. We can uh, um, uh, add some, some subjective variables over time. Yeah. Uh, or maybe just simple, at least if we look at free time, maybe just simple step counts could work. I'm, uh, I know I'm aware of that issue. Uh, that would be really the next next additional information or level of information so far yes thank you if you permit we have a last uh, question maybe so uh, uh, is there any alternative i cannot hear you i, I think you're <coughs> the mic was uh, closed so uh, thank you uh, we have a last question maybe uh, is there any alternative to use other uh, physiological variable for the intensity distribution like the maximal aerobic speed? Because for the film, uh, it is difficult to, 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 to measure lactate uh, threshold or uh, maximal lactate steady state. So uh, can we use the maximal uh, aerobic speed as a... I'm, I would say you almost can you, I don't want to say almost every information um, uh, I, I think the message I want to give to you is it depends on the sport uh, on the type of sport and um, a little bit maybe on the features you want to you want to improve and from there on you decide which technology provides you the, the most benefit um, I know it's not uh, it's not optimal. Maybe in rowing we would need to add different technologies in order to to get more information out of that. Uh, but, but what I want to to say is, if you choose a certain technology, try to use it on a 24-hour basis, if if that's possible. If battery size and, and, and storage size and capacity and everything, if that works, um, uh, that's number one. And uh, and to, to get a high resolution over time. So if, for example, it could be if you're more into, uh, if you engage more in, let's say, high altitude training, you might add something from more, let's say, blood saturation perspective, but also on a 24 hour cycle, because it is interesting how an athlete reacts during sleep and also uh, during exercise. So you would add maybe something like uh, uh, oxygen saturation measurement over time and the technologies available, um, or some, some sort of uh, near-infrared spectroscopy, or um, maybe some patches, uh, if I look into EMG evaluation. It, it depends a little bit on, on your setting, but um, the athlete needs to comply, you know, and they have to, they have to use the technology on a daily basis. They have to charge the batteries, upload the data, and so on. So, the more fancy you want to, the more information you want to have, the more complicated it becomes. And currently, at this stage, I'm, I'm sticking to the heart rate because um, athletes are aware of this technology. They can handle the technology. Battery life is okay. And data transmission is okay, but yeah, of course, I'd like to have more signals, you know, over time. Um, 
but that's it's it's often it's not feasible at, at least not in an uh, elite athletic um, scenario okay thank you but my, maybe this is a, a need to call for uh, unify the methods to of quantification tools so that we can provide really a certain uh, decision in the future because absolutely everyone is using different methodology this will make difficult to, to gather all the data and uh, absolutely thank you again uh, professor thank you, for thank you for the time. invitation and all the best all the best have a nice day so, Bye. okay so we come to the end of uh, this uh, session it was uh, fantastic we are on time so see you in the for the next session i remind that the, the audience that uh, the second session will start at uh, 1 25 pm have a good lunch Excellent. Thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, the invitation to come and talk to everybody here um, about something that I'm quite passionate about. Um, so just to check for a good one, can, can you see the presentation and can you hear me? Yeah, it's clear. Perfect. So I've uh, been in many presentations where people have started talking and everything's on mute and people have got no idea. <laughs> um, okay, so with kind of, as, as kind of the title suggests, what I'm looking at is physical activity, sedentary behaviour and sleep. And there's a kind of a little bit on the end there about time to get serious. And um, kind of hoping as, as I go through this kind of talk and presentation, maybe that phrase will uh, take on a few different meanings, um, particularly around the word time. So as a way of just a brief introduction to my background, um, so I hold two posts at the moment, which is uh, in Coventry University um, and at University Hospitals Coventry in Warwickshire. So I kind of sit in between the university and the NHS, uh, working with different data from patients with different uh, clinical or subclinical conditions, as well as then working with the health population around physical activity, sedentary behaviour and sleep. Primarily, um, I work with data. So much of my experience centers on how we handle this kind of data. So if we say the words physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep, that always conjures up uh, different meanings and definitions to all of us. We've all got an idea about what physical activity is and what being sedentary is and whether we slept well or not. 
um, but I'm kind of interested in well, actually, how do we measure that stuff? And then once we've measured it, how do we actually analyze it? Uh, because that is an extremely important step. And I guess why, why I'm so interested in this time element um, is really that there's a lot of literature out there looking at all of these constructs, physical activity, set of behavior, sleep. And um, I'm kind of interested in showcasing why potentially some of the findings out there may be spurious or incorrect or misleading due to some potentially inappropriate analysis of what is time-based data. And I will explain further as we go along. Okay, so first of all, I mean, let's look at these, these kind of four constructs are gonna be key as I, as I talk through here. Um, sensory behavior, I guess it depends on which different definitions we might take, whether they're based on I know, sensor-based definitions or uh, metabolic equivalent-based definitions. But, but broadly speaking, we can interpret these as, as they're written, really. You know, the sensory behavior, I mean, the, the art of, of uh, being sensory, not, not doing too much, typified by, for example, sitting in a chair, uh, doing our work, for example. Sleep, um, as you might refer to again, we can go in further detail about different stages of sleep and sleep cycles, but just as a broad construct, if we consider sleep, just going to sleep. Physical activity, again, maybe we can uh, refer to Casperson's classic definition um, of any kind of movement that requires more energy expenditure. Um, again, let's sit with that for now, that's fine. Um, again, as long as we can all conjure up an image of what, what we think physical activity is. And then for motor competence, uh, I mean, some people might, might have uh, come across this term, phrase, more fundamental movement skills, perhaps. But uh, in, this, in this context, I guess we're, we're talking about how, how well uh, or how competent a person is at performing these different tasks, usually fine motor and gross motor skills. So, I mean, I guess that. That sort of covers a little bit about what, what are they? Um, another important question is why, why should we bother measuring them? I mean, plain and simply, I think, if we were to look at our day, uh, we can probably segment most of our day into at least three of these behaviours. You know, how much of it did we spend being asleep? How much of it were we sedentary? And how much of it were we active? Um, and I think what's what's really interesting and why, why it's important is often these constructs, these these outcomes when measured, um, tend to either infer or are related to, are predictive of, or associated with a lot of uh, uh, clinical and <clears throat> non-clinical outcomes. For instance, so how motor competent or how much of a skilled mover uh, a child is. Uh, in the literature, it's often related to how physically active they are, um, which I guess makes sense, doesn't it? You know, if we move more, we're probably going to be better at moving. If we move less, we're not, we're not going to be so good. And I think generally, with, with the four constructs written on the screen, with our sleep, sensory behaviour, physical activity, and motor competence, um, I think you can probably all see how they're all interrelated and impacted by one another. You know, if you spend more time, you know, your, your Sunday, your Sunday morning, you know, I mean, typical for, for me in my teenage years, maybe uh, I wouldn't get up out of bed until midday. I'd spend a large portion of time in bed. Uh, and then maybe I'd get up and I'd have some cereal, and then I might play my video games. Um, you know, maybe then I'd go out and play football for a little bit, and then I'd come back and play video games and then go to sleep. But I mean, if we think of our day then, how much of that have I spent sleeping? How much sedentary? how much being active. And I think that, that's why it's important, because actually these different behaviours, I call them behaviours from now on, they're behaviours, um, they are not independent of one another, they are completely dependent on everything else. If I spend an extra hour in bed tomorrow, uh, I therefore have one hour less time I can spend either being sedentary or engaging in physical activity. And then that has consequential effects either in the short term, medium term and long term on various health-based outputs. 
okay, with my central. So I think an important question for us to have is how do we measure these, these physical behaviours? Um, so we've got our sleep and we've got our uh, physical activity and we've got our sensory behaviour. Well, how do we measure it? I mean, we can all we all have an idea about what, what these things are. Um, inherently, if I were to ask any of you, you know, how active were you yesterday? You could give some sort of answer. Yeah, I was quite active. But, I mean, how do we measure it to be able to quantify it? I mean, typically when we talk about measuring these behaviours, much of the literature tends to, to focus on uh, looking at the continuum of intensity and categorising this stuff, maybe less than what the behaviour actually is. So, you know, uh, typically looking at well, how much uh, intense, or how much vigorous exercise did we do, how much moderate, how much light, how much sensory, how much sleep. But maybe less, less important, or no, not less important, less focused upon often is what, what is that behaviour? Because sensory behaviour could look like sitting in a chair and watching telly, which I guess many of us would agree it's probably difficult to uh, find any physical benefits to that, technically speaking. But also being sensory could consist of a static at a desk doing writing, doing school work. I think we'd all agree that there are a lot of benefits um, kind of mentally, but then also in terms of fine motor skill, holding the pen and writing. So I think that's, that's sometimes there's something missing there. Uh, I mean, here's kind of a, a typical figure, what, what we, we might see, um, that I'll kind of look to demonstrate across different lectures when we're starting to look at, well, how are we going to measure any of this physical activity, this physical behaviour related stuff? I mean, you know, there's far more different methods that that could go onto this graph as well, you know, all the way down to um, say increasing accuracy of position. Uh, we're looking at energy expenditure, maybe uh, looking at doubling labelled water, for instance. But again, that if we're looking at what's going on here, there's always going to be a trade-off between accuracy and feasibility. Um, so if we want, you know, best study in the world, we have 100,000 people, we've all measured your doubling labelled water, brilliant. How, how feasible is it to get something like that? Uh, whereas if we take something like uh, some of the big, big questionnaire related studies uh, to surveys, you know, we can get hundreds of thousands of people filling out different var variations of recall surveys and questionnaires, um, but actually then compared to more direct observations, accuracy tends to dwindle, but our feasibility goes up. So I mean, in terms of selecting the right tool. Um, in my opinion, that, that tends to vary for for the job at hand. Uh, you know, I mean, what's the what's saying is uh, don't use a sledgehammer to crack a nut. So if uh, kind of a more modest approach to collecting the data is perfectly feasible and acceptable, don't go all out on something that's more expensive and burdensome for both the researcher and the participant. If, on the other hand, we're perhaps looking at something more maybe mechanistic in nature, we need very, very detailed, precise measurements, then start to look towards probably smaller sample size, but more detailed, uh, more direct measurements. And generally, I mean, it often vary on people's opinions uh, of what's optimal for measuring. And what accuracy? Well, if you've got a hundred thousand individual uh, participants' data properly being collected by a survey or questionnaire, there's absolutely nothing wrong with. But it's important to acknowledge some inherent limitations, or um, you know, with, with that when, when you're kind of interpreting the results. So there's going to be room for certain errors there. Um, similarly, with a potentially more detailed, accurate set of measurements. If we've got a very, very small n, a small sample, that's going to impact some of our modeling as well. So there are some methodological considerations to think about. Um, they're really important because they're going to impact my outcome, which is why generally, actually, I find accelerometers to be pretty useful in physical activity construct and measuring it. 
um, you can generally get pretty good numbers um, and it's pretty accurate as well. But it's fine, it's, it's for whatever purpose we need. In terms of practical considerations, well, got to bear in mind this is, this is a model, it's, it's theoretical. So it's, this hasn't ha actually happened, it's theoretical. But I think where, where this could be useful, I'm starting to reach a little bit with where I'm thinking this might be useful, uh, is right, you've got a pu public uh, fund of a million euros, a million pounds, to invest in an intervention for, uh, for whatever. So we want, we want uh, this clinical population or this group of children primary school children to be more physically active. That's a very laudable ambition. Okay, so what, what we can do is have a look at what is their current levels of activity. You know, we need to know what a baseline is first of all, so we can see whether things have improved. But let's look at the baseline. Okay, uh, now what happens, in theory, we can look at, we can model this. What happens if all of our children increase their MVPA? Uh, at the expense of sedentary behaviour. We can start to get an idea of the potential theoretical magnitude of change in our, in our outcome variables, whether that's a health outcome or a movement-based outcome. Uh, and so I kind of, the way I, I want to see this kind of uh, compositional work progress is to think about, well, can we use some of this stuff to perhaps help guide um, how we manage and plan interventions to help improve various health outcomes. Um, whether we can do that, I don't know. And to be honest, in my experience, I, I tend to see that if something's been funded, even if it's not working, they'll, they'll keep funding it until the end anyway. Um, but it, it's a, more of a hope on my end, to be honest with you. Okay, and then I think in terms of, kind of points I would go with, I think yeah, researchers, practitioners, any form of key stakeholder, I would strongly encourage you to consider the composition of physical behaviours, e even if even if that doesn't look like employing some detailed modelling. But uh, whatever kind of what line of work or research you're in, and you're working with patients or participants, and you're looking at this kind of behaviour, well, have think about the necessary impact of you trying to improve one behavior what that does to the other behaviors of a day okay because you, it's, it's inescapable um, by changing something on one side you impact it on the other side and it, that will always be the case um, you know in my opinion traditional analyses on their own of time use data you know, physical behavior data depending on what we're doing with it you know, if we're trying to use it to predict or associate with something, I don't believe it's uh, enough and it, strictly speaking, it's potentially inappropriate just to consider it on its own. Um, but, you know, there's still plenty of research out there as well on that. But I would really strongly recommend you consider that whole composition. Okay, and let's, let's be, uh, <laughs> finish with more of a, a strong, strong, strongly worded one. You know, disregarding the compositional nature of the behaviours is probably going to result in some spurious associations, uh, potentially some inappropriate inferences, and probably some missed opportunities. You know, again, we're we're focused so much on that, you know, the arbitrary five percent of MVPA. Um, that's always very very difficult to change. Maybe we're missing a trick and thinking, well, actually. Can we just get people who are very sedentary to do a little bit more light activity? Because anything, I mean, I'm happy with the mantra of anything is better than nothing. Um, but I'm just throwing my opinions at you now. And kind of a final thought with that is this will always be true. You've got 1,440 minutes. Allocate them wisely in your day. Um, or maybe perhaps you should be analyse them wisely. <laughs> um, okay, so nearly wrapping up and then I'd like to kind of go for some kind of questions, maybe some discussion with people, but I'd like to, to just thank um, a few people, um, including in particular Clarice Martins from the University of Porto, Mike Duncan from College University, Claire Roscoe from uh, University of Derby.
Okay, so I'd really like to welcome any, any kind of questions or, or discussion or, or comments, or even if you just flat out disagree with me, I'd love to hear. It was a very interesting uh, presentation about methodology consideration when we focus, for example, to study motor behavior, physical activity, and uh, sleep. Uh, I will check if uh, there is some question from the audience. Okay. Um, I have uh, some question about this presentation. I start with uh, this relation between um, physical activity, behavior, uh, and sleep. Does this relation uh, shape, uh, change according to the age, for example? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it's, it starts to some of it veer into uh, more of a physiological expertise, but I mean, from my experience of working with the data and stuff, I mean, the composition of, of behaviors and how much sleep and activity people do within different age groups, absolutely, it varies, and you know, you know, different age groups do require more sleep than others. Um, it absolutely does. So I think that, that that's always going to be a limitation of any of this kind of research when we look at at kind of our modelling. It's it's really only going to be strictly speaking relevant to the study population, and so we must be careful when we're trying to make generalised statements about them. Okay. Well, this model there must apply to the uh, 100,000 children of somewhere else. But it's, it's something that's got to be considered carefully, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, when we study physical activity behavior, shall we use, uh, for example, questionnaire or accelerometer or uh, the same? Uh, are, uh, usable, yeah. are useful for uh, analyze, analyze uh, physical activity behavior? Yeah, I mean, in terms of analyzing the data, I think. First of all, I'd like to take a step back and think, well, actually, what is, what's the purpose of your research? What's the aim? So really, I think that, that should predate what uh, your methodology is. So depending on what that is, should guide the tools you need to answer the question. Personally, I, I really like using accelerometers for things um, because there's lots that can be done with them. And in kind of a, a different part of my work, I like to play with um, accelerometer signals <laughs> to, to analyze them. But you miss out on big data with kind of a device based stuff. Um, and often, actually, this can be very cost prohibitive, even with you know, accelerometers and pedometers. Once we start scaling it up to thousands of people, it's very expensive. Um, so, kind of a, a little bit of a cop out on the question is. <laughs> Go back to what the first aim and hypothesis is, then use that to guide your tools. Okay. Um, my third question is about uh, isotopal substitution. When you add or we remove five minutes, the classification mm -hmm. of uh, physical activity behavior change. So what shall we do? Uh, add five minutes, remove five minutes? I mean, I guess, uh, so I would see the point of the isotemporal substitution is, is it's a theoretical exercise, I guess. So if you think, what, what, what do you want to do with your, your group of, of children or participants? You want to improve whatever your, your outcome variable is. You know, if it's, say, how they do mental competence. But if, if, if I add five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever else, <laughs> it, yeah. So for me, it can be guiding, can be interesting to see. I, I think um, I've kind of, shown different people and talked to different people before, it can be quite um, tempering of expectation. So some people are thinking, right, if I get them just to do 10 more minutes, it means that their motor competence is going to improve tenfold or something, which often is not the case. <laughs> yeah, I think taking the pinch of salt there. Okay. The last question is about the traditional lines <coughs> of physical activity behavior. It's not appropriate. So what shall we do? Well, to keep me in a job, I would say to do more compositional analysis. Um, but now, I mean, I think what I would say is, again, it's a fairly broad statement I've made there. Um, and there, there's always caveats to everything. Uh, again, so much of my work is with data and statistics. And we tend to like to 
it's kind of this uh, almost facade of being completely objective, but actually behind the objective set of numbers is a subjective person designing the model. Um, you know, um, in terms of them, whether some of the traditional analysis is completely inappropriate, it's probably it won't be completely inappropriate. But we really have to temper on what we're saying in our statements. You know, um, so I think it's considering that carefully. Uh, there is no other question from uh, the audience. Uh, we would like to thank uh, Dr. Clark for this nice presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So if, uh, if anybody would ever like to uh, discuss anything further about the compositional analysis or anything like that, feel free to um, get in contact at all. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. share my screen and just give me feedback if that works or not. Yeah, it's good. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Just uh, one minute for reflection and uh, the floor is open for you. Okay. okay. May I start? Just a minute. So today we are pleased to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Tim Mayer. Uh, Dr. Tim Mayer is a very special guest from uh, Germany. Uh, actually, um, Dr. Uh, Mayer is uh, in uh, Saarbrück University and his specialty is uh, specializing in sports and preventive medicine. And, uh, Professorship for uh, sports medicine. And uh, today, um, hey. with, uh, sharing with us hey. his expert opinion about uh, playing football is it beneficial or uh, detrimental for health? So, uh, Dr. Mayor, the floor is uh, open for you. Thank you very much for this kind introduction as well as for the uh, invitation to this conference. Um, the topic that uh, we have chosen for me is in, indeed a broad one, and I think at this stage I should mention uh, that there are two potential conflicts of interest, because I'm uh, chairman of the German as well of, as of the UEFA Medical Committee. However, to be honest, I do not consider these large conflicts of interest myself, but it should not be neglected. Um, when we want to decide if um, playing football is beneficial or detrimental for health, uh, we're talking about something like a net health effect. And uh, you can imagine that that might be difficult to calculate in the end. So what we're trying to do now is a comparison between the health benefits and the health risks of playing football. And when I say football here, um, my focus will be soccer, um, and in the end of the talk, I will have some uh, side notes on, on American football as well. Uh, but other codes of football will not be tackled, although I think many statements could also be uh, um, referred to them. The physiological properties of football are mostly well known. So uh, at least in elite football, the running distance goes up to 14 kilometers. So there is a relevant endurance component included. Um, there is an interval character of the sport with about 60 sprints, that is maximal acceleration sometimes, so it's not, not always the, the highest uh, velocity is reached. There are, uh, in a similar number, we have maximal decelerations, of course. That's already known since 2005, 
when a, when a well-read uh, uh, review has been published by a Norwegian group um, around Stalin. Um, there are other components um, like strength, flexibility, coordination, and cognitive requirements and others involved in football, which characterize this sport as a, a mix of, of several physiological properties who are all trained by playing football. From a more purely physiological standpoint, it is noteworthy that the heart rate during football matches goes up to 100%. Um, of course, there are decreases in heart rate during slower periods, but um, the minimal intensity is indeed close to the maximum that can be reached on a treadmill, for example. Um, although difficult to measure, um, blood pressure can be expected in the same high range because it is well known that catecholamines like adrenaline or noradrenaline um, are responsible for, um, for these high heart rate measures and at the same time, of course, other effects from sympathetic stimulation occur during football play. Theoretically, there are some risks and benefits and we will try to shed some light on them in the next few minutes. The risks include, of course, injuries, which may take a football player, if he's not a professional, um, well, for a professional as well, but um, any football player can be taken away from work uh, due to these injuries. Um, very recently, some uh, brain damage or, and maybe some long-term brain damage like neurodegenerative diseases have been mentioned. And of course, and most severely, uh, there might even be sudden cardiac death. Um, on the other hand side, there are a lot of potential benefits from playing football. Um, so the cardiocirculatory fitness might increase, at least in the long term. Um, there can be other positive cardiovascular effects and the prevention against some other chronic diseases might be effective. So let's start with the risks here and let's go from the most severe ones to the less severe ones. It is well known that there is a number of players um, that have suffered sudden cardiac death, and I only have listed uh, the famous ones here uh, over the last few years. And I think we all know that in uh, recreational um, football, there are probably more than these. But these illustrate well that there is at least a certain potential for sudden cardiac death um, in the sport of football. And um, there even exists a worldwide registry for these sudden cardiac death, which is run uh, by, by our institution and from which the first publication has come out this year. Um, the electronic publication was already in 2020 in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, um, and it covered more than 500 cases um, from which only for uh, around 350 um, good information was available um, about the circumstances, about the background, and it, it was shown that um, the, the pathologic causes behind these sudden cardiac death were quite similar to other sports, with the exception that collisions um, add to the cardiac diseases, which are mainly responsible for, for these sudden death. Um, and what was also found is very similar to um, national registries and to registries which are unspecific for sport, that in the older ones, the coronary artery disease is uh, prevailing, whereas in the younger ones, that is usually defined below 35 years of age, we find a mixture of different diseases, mainly myocarditis, coronary artery anomalies, cardiomyopathies, we find early coronary artery disease and so-called channelopathies, which are eon channel diseases, which, uh, need, which lead to um, arrhythmogenic uh, statuses. And it is well known uh, that intensity of a certain activity has a relationship to uh, fatalities, uh, at least when a cardiac disease is present. And this is already known for more than 
um, 40 years now um, from a very old publication in the year 1976 when um, 15 cases um, were evaluated um, of sudden cardiac death and uh, it became clear that those ones were more prone to sudden cardiac death that um, exercise at a higher intensity. And it should be known that it's not only elite football that takes place at these high intensities, but also, for example, veterans football. In 2016, we've published a paper about veterans football, about 100 veterans football players and measurements during training and match play. These veterans football players were um, between the age of 40 and 63 years. Um, so their cardiac strain during training match play was quite similar to what is found in elite players. Um, during training and match play, 100% of heart rate max was reached. Of course, they also showed the interval kind of um, um, the interval nature of, of stress. So uh, heart rate that did not remain at that level, but several times went up to almost or in, in fact maximal values. So it's not just a feature of younger ones to play at high intensity, but individually um, the veterans football players may be at the same intensity, that is at the same risk. And you need to take into account that for these older ones, it is much more likely that uh, coronary artery disease has already established. So maybe from a physician standpoint, from a health standpoint, this is rather our target population than the younger ones. Second point with risks uh, imposed by football um, is neurodegenerative disease. And this publication from Daniel McKay, which uh, occurred in the New England Journal, quite unusual for football publications, um, reached a lot of public attention, particularly in the UK. Um, and uh, what you see here, and we will come back to the same figures later, is um, that the hazard ratio of dying of, of dying um, uh, shows shows an incline during um, during the life of the football players when it is compared to the uh, general population. This is shown on the right hand side, and if you have a look at the uh, uh, sorry, this is shown on the left hand side. If you have a look at the right hand side, and you can see that the hazard ratio for any cause for ischemic heart disease, that is coronary artery disease, and for lung cancer, remains below one for former football players. And these were almost 8,000 football players from Scotland who were compared to more than 23,000 controlled persons from the Scottish population. And from the death certificates, it revealed that for any cause, as well as for ischemic heart disease and for lung cancer, as examples for, for chronic diseases, uh, the hazard ratio was below one. That is, the risk to die from these diseases was lower in football players than in non-football players. Um, the authors mention here that these players were former professionals. Uh, however, the situation is different for neurodegenerative disease. Uh, where we find um, four point, uh, hazard ratio of 4.1 and after some, um, some ad adjustments at least it, is, it reaches 3.5 in this study. So the conclusion of the, um, of the authors was that there is an association between playing football professionally and later the development of neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's disease um, that, that leads to, finally leads to death. Um, of course, it has to be taken into account that the only thing that was considered for this study was death certificates. So no other measures were made and uh, it's of course a bit unsure um, if in the case of Alzheimer's disease being put onto a death certificate it is really only Alzheimer's disease which was present. 
so even alzheimer's disease patients may suffer from coronary artery disease as well or other diseases um but this is this is obviously a limitation of that study however um the hazard ratio which is so much higher than one is of course impressive and has led to some precautions already now in in uh, british football uh, where they limited headers in children and try to limit them in adult players as well um, a bit in contrast to these results um, the same authors have published from the same subjects that uh, some psychiatric disorder, disorders which we would usually expect to be associated with neurodegenerative disease like anxiety depression or drug or alcohol abuse had a lower hazard in football players than in the general population so this is a little bit contrasting um, the uh, results found in the, in, in the Scottish football players. However, it is definitely at least a warning sign. And in these years, a lot of studies are addressing, addressing that issue in, in other countries as well. And we will see very soon if uh, these results are confirmed by, by other working groups. Finally, of course, there is a risk of injury and we have really good studies about injuries in elite football but uh, not so many in sub elite football that is a little bit because um, the gold standard of injury reporting has recently been um, only reports from medical teams and you can imagine that when you go to the fifth or sixth league in a country there simply is no medical stuff so um, this means as long as we hold this standard uh, on that level we will hardly get good information from lower leagues however we know of course a little bit about these upper leagues and the most well-known study is the uefa injury, injury study which is now called the elite club injury study which is run by the working group of Jan extra in sweden and uh, even in 2011 they had already analyzed an impressive number of more than 4,400 injuries occurring in 566,000 hours of exposure and they calculated an injury incidence of eight injuries per 1,000 hours um, so since uh, the, the consensus statement from uh, Colin Fuller in 2005 um, injuries are usually reported uh, this way because it is accepted as the most appropriate one and a thousand hours is uh, either training or match play and when a distinction is made between matches and training which you can see in the lowest lines here it reveals that the incidence during match play is much much higher than uh, during training in this case 